love's martyr or Rosalind's complaint, allegorically shadowing the truth of love in the constant fate of the phoenix and turtle. A poem interlaced with much variety and rarity, now first translated out of the venerable Italian Torquato Cagliano by Robert Chester, with the true legend of famous King Arthur, the last of the nine worthies being the first essay of a new British poet collected out of diverse authentical records. To these are added some new compositions of several modern writers whose names are subscribed to their several works upon the first subject viz. The Phoenix and Turtle, Marmutare Dominum, Non Potest Liber Notus. London imprinted for eat beep beep thousand six hundred and one. To the Honourable, and of me before all other, honoured knight, Sir John Salisbury, one of the esquires of the body to the Queen's most excellent majesty, Robert Chester wisheth increase of virtue and honour. Posse and Noel, noble, honourable sir, having according to the directions of some of my best-minded friends, finished my long-expected labour, knowing this ripe judging world to be full of envy. Everyone, as sound reason requireth, thinking his own child to be fairest, although an Ethiopian, I am emboldened to put my infant wit to the eye of the world under your protection. Knowing that if absurdity like a thief have crept into any part of these rooms, your well-graced name will overshadow these defaults, and the known character of your virtues cause the common backbiting enemies of good spirits to be silent. To the world I put my child to nurse, at the expense of your favour, whose glory will stop the mouths of the vulgar, and I hope cause the learned to rock it asleep, for your sake, in the bosom of good will. Thus wishing you all the blessings of heaven and earth. Len, yours in all service, Robert Chester, the author's request to the phoenix. Phoenix of beauty, beauteous bird of en- To thee, I do entitle all my labour. More precious in mine eye by far than many, that feedst all earthly senses with thy savour. Accept my home writ praises of thy love, and kind acceptance of thy turtle dove. Some deep red scholar famed for poetry, whose wit enchanting verse deserveth fame, should sing of thy perfections passing beauty, and elevate thy famous worthy name. Yet I, the least and meanest in degree, endeavoured have to please in praising thee. Robert Chester, to the kind reader, of bloody wars, nor of the sack of Troy, of Priam's murdered sons, nor Didu's fall, of Helen's rape, by Paris' Trojan boy, of Caesar's victories, nor Pompey's thrall, of Lucrece rape, being ravished by a king, of none of these, of sweet conceit I sing. Then, gentle reader, overread my muse, that arms herself to fly a lowly flight. My untuned stringed verse do thou excuse, that may perhaps accepted, yield delights. I cannot climb in praises to the sky, least falling, I be drowned with infamy. Ma mecum porto, Robert Chester, Rosalind's complaint, metaphorically applied to Dame Nature at a parliament held in the high star chamber by the gods, for the preservation and increase of earth's beauteous phoenix, a solemn day of meeting amongst the gods, and royal parliament there was ordained, the heavenly synod was at open odds and many hearts with earthly wrongs were pained. Some came to crave excuse, some to complain, of heavy burdened griefs they did sustain. Vesta, she told, her temple was defiled. Juno, how that her nuptial knot was broken. Venus from her son Cupid was exiled, and palace tree with ignorance was shoken. Bellona raved at lord-like cowardice, and Cupid that fond ladies were so nice. To this assembly came Dame Nature weeping, and with her handkerchief through wet with tears. She dried her rosy cheeks, made pale with sighing, hanging her waffle head, head full of fears, and to Jove's self-placed in a golden seat. She kneeled her down, and thus scanned to entreat. Thou mighty imperator of the earth, thou ever-living regent of the air, that to all creatures givest a lively breath, and thunderest wrath down from thy fiery chair. Behold thy handmaid, king of earthly kings, that to thy gracious sight sad tidings bring, one rare rich phoenix of exceeding beauty, one nun like lily in the earth I placed, one fair Helena, to whom men owe duty, 
One country with a milk-white dove, I graced, one and none such, since the wide world was found, hath ever nature placed on the ground. Head, her head I framed of a heavenly map, wherein the sevenfold virtues were enclosed, when great Apollo slept within my lap, and in my bosom had his rest reposed. I cut away his locks of purest gold, and placed them on her head of earthly mould. Hair, when the least whistling wind begins to sing, and gently blows her hair about her neck, like to a chime of bells it soft doth ring, and with the pretty noise the wind doth check her, able to lull asleep a pensive heart, that of the round world's sorrows bears a part. Forehead, her forehead is a place for princely Jove, to sit and censure matters of import, wherein men read the sweet concepts of love, to which heart-pained lovers do resort, and in this tablet find to cure the wound, for which no salve or herb was ever found. Eyes, under this mirror, are her princely eyes, two carbuncles, two rich imperial lights, that o'er the day and night do sovereignize, and their dim tapers to their rest she frights. Her eyes excel the moon and glorious sun, and when she riseth all their force is done. Cheeks, her morning-coloured cheek, in which is placed a lily lying in a bed of roses, this part above all other I have graced, for in the blue veins you may read sweet posies. When she doth blush, the heavens do wax red. When she looks pale, that heavenly front is dead. Chin, her chin, a little, little pretty thing, in which the sweet carnation gelly flower is round in compass in a crystal ring, and of that pretty orb doth bear a power. No storm of envy can this glory touch though many should assay it overmuch. Lips, her lips two ruby gates from whence doth spring, sweet honey dew by an entangled kiss. From forth these glories doth the night bird sing, a nightingale that no right notes will miss. True learned eloquence and poetry do come between these doors of excellency. Teeth, her teeth are hewed from rich crystal rocks, or from the Indian pearl of much esteem. These in a closet her deep counsel locks, and are as porters to so fair a queen. They taste the diet of the heavenly train, other base grossness they do still disdain. Tongue, her tongue the utterer of all glorious things, the silver clapper of that golden bell, that never soundeth but to mighty kings, and when she speaks, her speeches do excel. He in a happy chair himself doth place, whose name with her sweet tongue she means to grace. Neck, her neck is Vesta's silver conduct pipe, in which she powers perfect chastity, and of the music grapes in summer ripe, she makes a liquor of retiety, that dyes this swan-like pillar to a white, more glorious than the day with all his light. Breast, her breast's two crystal orbs of whitest white, two little mounts from whence life's comfort springs, between those hillocks Cupid doth delight to sit and play, and in that valley sing, looking love babies in her wanton eyes, that all gross vapours thence doth chaste as eyes. Armed, her arms are branches of that silver tree, that men surname the rich Hesperides, a precious circling show of modesty, when she doth spread these glories happiness. Ten times ten thousand blessings he doth taste, whose circled arms shall cling about her waist, hands, her hands are fortune's palms, where men may read, his first hour's destiny, or weal, or woe, when she this sky-like map abroad doth spread, like pilgrims many to this saint do go, and in her hand, white hand, they there do see, love lying in a bed of yuri, fingers, her fingers long and small do grace her hand, for when she too sheth the sweet-sounding lute, the wild, untamed beasts amazed do stand, and carol-chanting birds are sudden mute. O oh, fingers, how you grace the silver wires, and in humanity burn Venus fires. Belly, her belly, O oh, grace incomprehensible, far whiter than the milk-white lily flower, O oh, might Arabian phoenix come invisible, and on this mountain build a glorious bower, then sun and moon as tapers to her bed. Would light love's lord to take her maidenhead. Note her, be still my thought, be silent all ye muses, 
wit-flowing eloquence now grace my tongue. Arise, old Homer, and make no excuses. Of a rare piece of art must be my song, of more than most, and most of all, beloved. About the which Venus' sweet doves have hovered, there is a place in lovely paradise, from whence the golden Gahon overflows, a fountain of such honorable prize, that none the sacred, sacred virtues knows, walled about, betokening sure defense, with trees of life to keep bad errors thence, thighs, her thighs two pillars fairer far than fair, two underprops of that celestial house, that mansion that is Juno's silver chair, in which Ambrosia Venus doth carouse, and in her thighs the pretty veins are running, like crystal rivers from the main streams flowing, legs, her legs are made as graces to the rest, so pretty, white, and so proportionate, that leads her to love's royal sportive nest, like to a light bright angel in her gate, for why no creature in the earth but she, is like an angel, angel let her be, feet, her feet, now draw I to conclusion, a neat and little to delight the eye, no team in all human invention, or in the vein of sweet writ poetry, can e'er be found to give her feet that grace, that bears her corporate soul from place to place. And if by night she walk, the marigold, that doth enclose the glory of her eye, at her approach her beauty doth unfold, and spreads herself in all her royalty. Such virtue hath this phoenix glassy shield, that flowers and herbs at her fair sight do yield. And if she grace the walks within the day, Flora doth spread an arras cloth of flowers. Before her do the pretty satires play, and make her banquets in their leafy bower. Head, hair, brow, eyes, cheeks, chin, and all. Lips, teeth, tongue, neck, breasts, belly are majestical. This phoenix I do fear me will decay, and from her ashes never will arise. An other bird her wings for to display and her rich beauty for to equalize. The Arabian fires are too dull and base to make another spring within her place, therefore dread regent of these elements, pity poor nature in her art excelling. Give thou an humble ear to my laments, that to thee have a long true tale been telling, of her who, when it please thee to behold, her outward sight shall beauty's pride unfold. At these words Jove stood as a man amazed, and Juno's love-bred beauty turned to white. Venus she blushed, and on Dame Nature gazed, and Vesta she began to weep outright. And little Cupid poor boy struck in love, with repetition of this earthly dove, but at the last Jove gan to rouse his spirit, and told Dame Nature in her sweet discourse, her woman's tongue did run before her wit, such a fair soul herself could never nurse, nor in the vasty earth was ever living such beauty that all beauty was excelling. Nature was struck with pale to merit, to see the god of thunder's lightning eye. He shook his knotty hair so wrathfully, as if he did the heavenly rout despise. Then down upon her knee dame nature falls, and on the great god's name aloud she calls, Jove, thou shalt see my commendations, to be unworthy and impartial, to make of her an exhalation, whose beauty is divine majestical. Look on that painted picture there, behold, the rich-wrought phoenix of Arabian gold. Jove's eyes were settled on her painted eyes. Jove blushing smiled, the picture smiled again. Jove spoke to her, and in his heart did rise. Love's amours, but the picture did disdain. To love the god, Jove would have stole a kiss. But Juno, being by, denied him this. When all the rest beheld this counterfeit, they knew the substance was of rarer price. Some gazed upon her face, on which did wait, as messengers, her two celestial eyes. Eyes wanting fire, did give a lightning flame, how much more would her eyes man's senses tame, than all the gods and goddesses did decree, in humble manner to entreat of Jove. And every power upon his bended knee, showed faithful service in Dame Nature's love, entreating him to pacify his ire and raise another phoenix of new fire. Her picture from Jove's eyes hath banished hate, and mildness plain the furrows of his brow. Her painted shape hath chastised debate, and now to pleasure them he makes a vow. Then thus Jove spake, 
Tis pity she should die, and leave no offspring of her progeny. Nature, go hie thee, get thee, Phoebus' chair. Cut through the sky, and leave Arabia. Leave that ill work in peace of fruitless air. Leave me the plains of white Britannia. These countries have no fire to raise that flame. That, to this phoenix bird, can yield a name. There is a country climate famed of old, that hath to name delightsome Paphosile. Over the mountain tops to trudge, be bold. There let thy winged horses rest a while. Where in a vale like Cyparissus grove, thou shalt behold a second phoenix love. A champion country full of fertile plains, green grassy meadows, little pretty hills, abundant pleasure in this place remained, and plenteous sweets this heavenly climate fills. Fair flowing bathes that issue from the rocks, abundant herds of beasts that come by flock, high stately cedars, sturdy big-armed oaks, great poplars, and long trees of Lebanon, sweet-smelling fire that frankincense provokes, and pineapples from whence sweet juice doth come. The summer blooming hath thorn under this, fair Venus from Adonis stole a kiss, fine thickets and rough brakes for sport and pleasure, places to hunt the light-foot nimble roe, these groves Diana did account her treasure, and in the cold shades oftentimes did go, to lie her down, faint, weary on the ground, whilest that her nymphs about her daunced around, a choir of heavenly angels tune their voices, and counterfeit the nightingale in singing, at which delight some pleasure she rejoices, and plenty from her cell her gifts is bringing, pears, apples, plums, and the red ripe cherries, sweet strawberries with other dainty berry. Here haunt the satyrs and the dryades, the hamadryades and pretty elves, that in the groves with skipping many please, and run along upon the water shelves. Here mermaids sing, but with Ulysses' ears, the country gallants do disdain their tears. The crocodile and hissing adders sting, may not come near this holy plot of ground. No nightworm in this continent may sing, not poison-spitting serpent may be found. Here milk and honey like two rivers ran, as fruitful as the land of Canaan. What shall I say? Their orchards spring with plenty, the gardens smell like Flora's paradise, bringing increase from one to number twenty, as licorice and sweet Arabian spice. No place is found under bright heaven's fair bliss, to bear the name of paradise but this, hard by a running stream or crystal fountain wherein rich orient pearl is often found, environed with a high and steepy mountain, a fertile soil and fruitful plot of ground. There shalt thou find true honour's lovely squire, that for this phoenix keeps Prometheus fire, his bower wherein he lodgeth all the night, is framed of cedars and high lofty pie. I made his house to chastise thence despite, and framed it like this heavenly roof of mine. His name is liberal honour, and his heart, aims at true faithful service and desart. Look on his face, and in his brows doth sit, blood and sweet mercy hand in hand united, blood to his foes, a president most fit, for such as have his gentle humour spited. His hair is curled by nature mild and meek, hangs careless down to shroud a blushing cheek. Give him this ointment to anoint his head, this precious balm to lay unto his feet, these shall direct him to this phoenix bed, where on a high hill he this bird shall meet, and of their ashes by my doom shall rise, another phoenix her to equalize. This said the gods and goddesses did applaud, the censure of this thundering magistrate, and nature gave him everlasting lord, and quickly in the day's bright coach she gate. Down to the earth she's whirled through the air, Jove joined these fires, Thus Venus made her prayer, an introduction to the prayer. Guide, thou great guider of the sun and moon, thou elemental favorer of the night, my undeserved wit, wit sprung too soon, to give thy greatness every gracious right. Let pen, hand, wit, and underserving tongue, thy praise and honor sing in every song. In my poor prayer, guide my hand aright. Guide my dull wit, guide all my dulled senses. Let thy bright taper give me faithful light, and from thy book of life blot my offenses. Then armed with thy protection and thy love, 
he make my prayer for thy turtle dove, a prayer made for the prosperity of a silver-colored dove, applied to the beauteous phoenix. O oh, thou great maker of the firmament, that ridest upon the winged cherubim, and on the glorious shining element, hearest the sad prayers of the seraphims, that unto thee continually sing hymns, bow down thy listening ears, thou God of might, to him whose heart will praise thee day and night, accept the humble prayers of that soul, that now lies wallowing in the mire of sin. Thy mercy, Lord, doth all my powers control, and searcheth reins and heart that are within. Therefore to thee, Jehovah, I'll begin, lifting my head from my imprisoned grave. No mercy but thy mercy me can save, the foul, untamed lion still goes roaring. Old hell-bred sath an enemy to mankind, to lead me to his jaws that are devouring, wherein no grace to humane flesh is assigned, but thou, celestial father, canst him bind. Tread on his head, tread sine and sath and dow, and on thy servant's head set mercy's crown. Thus in acceptance of thy glorious sight, I purge my deadly sin in hope of grace. Thou art the door, the lanthorn, and the light, to guide my sinful feet from place to place. And now, O Christ, I bow before thy face, and for the silver-colored earthly dove, I make my earnest prayer for thy love. Shroud her, O Lord, under thy shadowed wings, from the world's envious malice and deceit, that like the adder poisoned serpent sting, and in her way lays a corrupted bait, yet raise her God unto thy mercy's height. Guide her, O oh, guide her from pernicious foes, that many of thy creatures overthrows. Wash her, O oh Lord, with high soap and with thyme, and the white snow she shall excel in whiteness. Purge her with mercy from all sinful crime, and her soul's glory shall exceed in brightness. O oh, let thy mercy grow unto such ripeness. Behold her, O oh, behold her gracious King, that unto thee sweet songs of praise will sing, and as thou leads through the red-colored waves, the host of thy elected Israel, and from the wrath of Pharaoh didst them save, appointing them within that land to dwell, a chosen land, a land what did excel. So guide thy silver dove unto that place, where she temptations envy may outface, increase thy gifts bestowed on thy creature, and multiply thy blessings manifold. And as thou hast adorned her with nature, so with thy blessed eyes her eyes behold, that in them doth thy workmanship unfold. Let her not with the Lord without increase, but bless her with joy's offspring of sweet peace. Amen, amen, to those of light belief, you gentle favorers of excelling muses, and graces of all learning and desire, you whose conceit the deepest work peruses, whose judgments still are governed by art. Read gently what you read, this next conceit, framed of pure love, abandoning deceit, and you whose dull imagination and blind conceited error hath not known, of herbs and trees true nomination, but think them fabulous that shall be shown. Learn more, search much, and surely you shall find plain honest truth and knowledge comes behind. Then gently, gentle reader, do thou favor, and with a gracious look grace what is written. With smiling cheer peruse my homely labor, with envy's poison spiteful look not bitten, so shalt thou cause my willing thought to strive, to add more honey to my new-made hive, a meeting dialogue-wise between nature, the phoenix, and the turtle dove. Nature, all hail fair phoenix, whither art thou flying? Why in the hot sun dost thou spread thy wings? More pleasure shouldst take in cold shades lying, and for to bathe thyself in wholesome spring, where the woods feathered choir sweetly sing. Thy golden wings and thy breast's beauteous eye will fall away in Phoebus' royalty. Phoenix, oh, stay me not, I am no phoenix I, and if I be that bird, I am defaced. Upon the Arabian mountains I must die, and never with a poor young turtle grace. Such operation in me is not placed. What is my beauty but a painted wall? My golden spreading feathers quickly fall. Nature, why dost thou shed thy feathers, kill thy heart? Weep out thine eye, and stain thy golden face. Why dost thou of the world's woe take a part? 
and in relenting tears thyself disgraced. Joy's mirthful tower is thy dwelling place. All birds for virtue and excelling beauty sing at thy reverend feet in love and duty. Phoenix, oh, how thou feedest me with my beauty's praising! Oh, how thy praise sounds from a golden tongue! Oh, how thy tongue my virtues would be raising! And raising me thou dost corrupt thy song, thou seest not honey and poison mixed among. Thou notest my beauty with a jealous look, but dost not see how I do bait my hook. Nature, tell me, oh, tell me, for I am thy friend. I am Dame Nature that first gave thee breath, that from Jove's glorious rich seat did descend, to set my feet upon this lumpish earth. What is the cause of thy sad, sullen mirth? Hast thou not beauty, virtue, wit, and favor? What other graces wouldst thou crave of nature? Phoenix, what is my beauty but a vading flower? wherein men read their deep-conceived thrall, alluring twenty gallants in an hour to be as servile vassals at my call. My sun-bred looks their senses do exhale, but, oh, my grief, where my fair eyes would love. Foul, blear-eyed envy doth my thoughts reprove. What is my virtue but a tablatory, which if I did bestow would more increase? What is my wit but an inhumane glory? That to my kind dear friends would proffer peace, but O oh, vain bird, give o'er in silence, cease. Malice perchance doth hearken to thy words, that cuts thy thread of love with twenty swords. Nature, tell me, O oh, mirror of our earthly type, tell me, sweet phoenix glory of mine age, who blots thy beauty with foul envy's cry, and locks thee up in fond suspicion's cage. Can any humane heart bear thee such rage? Daunt their proud stomachs with thy piercing eye. Unchain love's sweetness at thy liberty. Phoenix, what is it to bath me in a wholesome spring, or wash me in a clear, deep, running well, when I know virtue from the same do bring? Nor of the balmy water bear a smell. It better were for me monks crows to dwell, than flock with doves, when doves sit always billing and waste my wings of gold, my beauty killing. Nature, I'll chain foul envy to a brazen gate, and place deep malice in a hollow rock. To some black desert wood I'll banish hate, and fond suspicion from thy sight I'll lock. These shall not stir, let any porter knock. Thou art but young, fresh, green, and must not pass, but catch the not sun with thy steeled glass, phoenix. That sun shines not within this continent, that with his warm rays can my dead blood cherish, gross cloudy vapors from this air is sent, not hot reflecting beams my heart to nourish. O oh, beauty, I do fear me thou wilt perish, then gentle nature let me take my flight, but ere I pass, set envy out of sight, nature, he conjure him, and raise him from his grave, and put upon his head a punishment. Nature thy sportive pleasure means to save. I'll send him to perpetual banishment, like to a tottered fury raged and rent. I'll baffle him and blind his jealous eye, that in thy actions secrecy would pray. Phoenix, I'll conjure him, I'll raise him from his cell, I'll pull his eyes from his conspiring head. I'll lock him in the place where he doth dwell. I'll starve him there till the poor slave be dead, that on the poisonous adder oft hath fed. These threatenings on the hellhound I will lay, but the performance bears the greater sway. Nature, stand by fair phoenix, spread thy wings of gold, and daunt the face of heaven with thine eye. Like Juno's bird thy beauty do unfold, and thou shalt triumph o'er thine enemy. Then thou and I in Phoebus' coach will fly, where thou shalt see and taste a secret fire. That will add spreading life to thy desire. Arise thou blear-eyed envy from thy bed, thy bed of snaky poison and corruption. Unmake thy big swollen cheeks with poison red, for with thee I must try conclusion, and plague thee with the world's confusion. I charge thee by my power to appear, and by celestial warrant to draw near. Phoenix, oh, what a misty damp breaks from the ground, able itself to infect this noisome air. 
as if a cave of toads themselves did wound, or poisoned dragons fell into despair. Hell's dam sent with this may not compare, and in this foggy cloud there doth arise a damned fiend o'er me to tyrannize. Nature, he shall not touch a feather of thy wing, or ever have authority and power, as he hath had in his days secret pray. Over thy calmy looks to send a shower, I'll place thee now in secrecy's sweet bower, where at thy will in sport and dallying, spend out thy time in amorous discoursing. Phoenix, look nurse, look nature how the villain sweats, his big swan eyes will fall unto the ground, with fretting anguish he his black breast beats, as if he would true-hearted minds confound. Oh, keep him back, his sight my heart doth wound. Oh, envy it is thou that madest me perish, for want of that true fire my heart should nourish. Nature, but I will plague him for his wickedness. Envy go pack thee to some foreign soil, to some desert full plain or wilderness, where savage monsters and wild beasts do toil, and with inhumane creatures keep a coil. Be gone, I say, and never do return, till this round compass world with fire do burn. Phoenix, what is he gone? Is envy packed away? Then one foul blot is moved from his throne, that my poor honest thoughts did seek to slay. Away foul grief and over heavy mind, that do o'er recharge me with continual groans. Will you not hence, then with downfalling tears, I'll drown myself in ripeness of my years? Nature, fie peevish bird, what art thou frantic mad? Wilt thou confound thyself with foolish grief, if there be cause or means for to be had? Thy nurse and nourisher will find relief. Then tell me all thy accidents in brief. Have I not banished envy for thy sake? I greater things for thee I'll undertake. Phoenix, envy is gone and banished from my sight, banished for ever coming any more. But in Arabia burns another light, a dark dim taper that I must adore. This barren country makes me to deplore. It is so sapless that the very spring makes tender new-grown plants be withering. The noisome air is grown infectious. The very springs for want of moisture die. The glorious sun is here pestiferous. No herbs for physic or sweet surgery, no balm to cure heart's inward malady, no gift of nature, she is here defaced. Heart-curing balsamum here is not placed. Nature, is this the sum and substance of thy woe? Is this the anchor hold unto thy boat? Is this thy sea of grief doth overflow? Is this the river sets thy ship afloat? Is this the lesson thou hast learned by rote? And is this all? And is this plot of ground? The substance of the theme doth thee confound. Phoenix, this is the anchor hole, the sea, the river, the lesson and the substance of my song. This is the rock my ship did seek to shiver. And in this ground with adders was I stung, and in a loathsome pit was often flung. My beauty and my virtues captivate to love, dissembling love that I did hate. Nature. Cheer up thy spirit, Phoenix, prune thy wings, and double gild thy feathers for my news. A nightingale and not a raven sings, that from all black contention will excuse thy heavy thoughts and set them to Peru. Another climate where thou mayst express a plot of paradise for worthiness. Jove in divine divineness of his soul, that rides upon his fiery axle tree, that with his mace doth humane flesh control. When of man's deeds he makes a registry, loving the good for singularity, with a veiled countenance and a gracious smile, did bid me plant my bird in Paphosili. Phoenix, what ill divining planet did presage, my timeless birth so timely brought to light? What fatal comet did his wrath engage, to work a harmless bird such worlds despite, wrapping my day's bliss in black sable's night? No planet nor no comet did conspire. My downfall, but soul fortune's wrathful ire. What did my beauty move her to disdain? Or did my virtues shadow all her bliss, that she should place me in a desert plain? And send forth envy with a Judas kiss, to sting me with a scorpion's poisoned hiss, from my first birthright for to plant me here, where I have always fed on grief and fear.
nature, rail not gainst fortune's sacred deit, in youth thy virtuous patience she hath tired. From this base earth she'll lift thee up on high, where in contents rich chariot thou shalt ride, and never with impatience to abide. Fortune will glory in thy great renown, and on thy feathered head will set a crown. Phoenix, t'was time to cup, for I was comfortless, and in my youth have been infortunate. This isle of Paphos I do hope will bless her, and alter my half-rotten tottering state. My heart's delight was almost ruinate. In this rich, a turtle had his nest, and in a wood of gold took up his rest. Nature, fly in this chariot, and come sit by me, and we will leave this ill-corrupted land. We'll take our course through the blue azure sky, and set our feet on Paphos' golden sand. There of that turtle dove we'll understand, and visit him in those delightful plains, where peace conjoined with plenty still remains. Phoenix, I come, I come, and now farewell that strong, upon whose craggy rocks my ship was rent. Your ill-beseeming follies made me fond, and in a vasty cell I up was pent, where my fresh, blooming beauty I have spent. Oh, blame yourselves, ill-nurtured, cruel swains, that filled my scarlet glory full of stains. Nature, welcome immortal beauty, we will ride over the semicircle of Europa, and bend our course where we will see the tide that parts the continent of Africa, where the great cham governs Tartaria, and when the starry curtain veils the night, in Paphos sacred are we mean to light. Phoenix, how glorious is this chariot of the day, where Phoebus in his crystal robes is set, and to poor passengers directs a way. O oh, happy time since I with nature met, my melodious discord I unfret, and sing sweet hymns, burn myrrh and frankincense, honor that isle that is my sure defense. Nature, look Phoenix o'er the world as thou dost ride, and thou shalt see the palaces of kings, great huge built cities where high states abide, temples of gods, and altars with rich offering, to which the priests their sacrifices bring, wonders past wonder, strange pyramids, and the gold-gathering strand of Euphrates, Phoenix, oh, what rich pleasure dwelleth in this land! Green springing meadows, high upreared hills, the white-fleeced ewe brought tame unto the hand, fair running rivers that the country fills, sweet flowers that fair balmy dew distills, great peopled cities whose earth-gracing show. Time is a shame to touch or overthrow. Nature, be silent, gentle phoenix, I'll repeat some of these cities' names that we descry, and of their large foundation I'll entreat. Their founder that first reared them upon high, making a glorious spectacle to each eye. War's wall defender and the country's grace, not battered yet with time's controlling maze. Alfred the father of fair Elfleda, founded three goodly famous monasteries. In this large isle of sweet Britannia, for to refresh the poor soul's miseries that were afflicted with calamities, one in the town surnamed Edlingsey, which after ages called Athelney, the second house of that devotion. He did erect at worthy Winchester, a place well planted with religion, called in this age the new builded minster, still kept in notable reparation, and in this famous builded monument, his body was in turn when life was spent, the last not least surpassing all the rest, was Oxford's honourable foundation, since when with learning's glory it is blessed, begun by the godly exhortation of the abbot Neotus' direction from whose rich womb pure angel-like divinity hath sprung to save us from calamity, lair the son of Baldud being admitted, to bear the burden of the British sway, a prince with nature's glory being fitted. At what time Joas reigned king of Judah, to make his new got fame to last for I, by saw he built the town of Serlia, that to this day is called Leicester, Belin that famous worthy Briton king. That made the towns of France to fear his frown, and the whole Romish legion to sing, and to record his gracious great renown, whose host of men their towns were firing, builded in Southwall's height Caerlia, or termed Arwiskasir Legion. This glorious city was the only pride, in eldest age of all Demetia, 
where many notable monuments abide, to grace the country of Britannia, that from time's memory can never slide. Amphibulus was born in this sweet place, who taught St. Alban, Alban full of grace. King Lud surnamed the great Lud Herdibras, the son of Ley, builded the famous town of Karkin, with a huge tower of brass, now called Canterbury of great renown. Able to bide the raging foe's stout frown, the metropolitan seat where learning sits, and chief of all our English bishoprics, this noble king builded fair Cairgrin, now clept Winchester of worthy fame, and at Mount Palador he built his tent, that after ages Shaftesbury hath to name, his first foundation from King Lael's son came, about which building prophet Aquila did prophesy in large Britannia. King Leal, a man of great religion, that made his bordering neighbors for to yield, and on their knees to plead submission, being eldest son to brute surnamed Green Shield, the city of Serlites he did build, now called Carlisle by corruption, and time that leads things to confusion, Cambridge a famous university, the nurse of learning and experience, the cherisher of true divinity, that for the soul's good wisdom doth commence, confuting vice and driving error thence, was built by Sigisbert but wrought effectually, by kings and lords of famous memory, Ebranca the son of stout Mempricius, having in matrimonial copulation twenty-one wives in large Britannicus, and thirty daughters by just computation, and twenty sons of estimation, builded Kerbranca famous for the name, now called England's York a place of fame, he in Albania large and populous, now termed Scotland of the Scottish sect, because his deeds should still be counted famous, the castle of maidens there he did erect, and to good purpose did this work effect, but iron-eating time the truth doth stay, for Edinburgh the city doth remain, and in that maiden castle he did frame, to grace the building to the outward eye, Nine images of stone placed in the same, which since have stayed time's perpetuity in the true form of workman's excellency, not any whit diminished, but as perfect, as in the first day's minute they were set. Phoenix, nature I muse at your description, to see how time that old rust-cankered wretch honors forgetful friend, city's confusion, that in all monuments hath made a breach, to ancient names brought alteration. And yet at this day such a place remains, that all times honour past with honour stains, nature, those carved old cut stony images, that beautify the prince's stately tower, that graces with their grace the palaces, and high imperial emperising bowers, were never raised by time's controlling hours. Nine worthy women almost equivalent, with those nine worthy men so valiant. Three of the nine were Jews, and three were Gentiles, three Christians, honours honourable sex, that from their foes did often bear the spoils, and did their proud controlling neighbours vex, which to their name did nobleness annex, an emblem for true-born gentility, to imitate their deeds in chivalry, the first Minerva a right-worthy pagan, that many manlike battles manly fought, she first devised artillery of iron, and armour for our backs she first found out, putting our lives dear hazard from some doubt. She governed the Libyans, and got victories, with honour by the Lake Tritonides. Our main pitched battels she first ordered, setting a form down to this following age. The orders of encamping she first registered, and taught the laws of arms in equipage. To after time her skill she did engage. Apollo was her dear begotten son, in Abraham's time she lived till life was done. Semiramis, queen of Assyria, was second worthy of this world's great wonder. She conquered large Ethiopia, and brought the neck of that stout nation under, wasting the countries of rich India. Her days of honor and of regiment was in the time of Isaac's government, the third and chiefest for audaciousness. And enterprises that she took in hand was Tamiris full of true nobleness, queen of the north as I do understand. From forth her eyes she lightened on as Bran, and brandished a sword, a sword of fame, that to her weak sex yielded Hector's name. When she received news her son was dead, 
the hope and underprop of Scythia, she put on armor and encountered the monarch Cyrus, king of Persia, and governor of rich Catulia, slew him in fight her fame for to renew, two hundred thousand soldiers overthrew. Amongst the Hebrew women we commend, Jehel the Kenite for the first in bounty, whose incomprehensible valor in the end did free and set at large her captived country, oppressed with tyrannical misery, from dangers imminent of fiery war, by killing hand to hand her foe great Sassar, Deborah, an Hebrew worthy the second place. She forty years did govern Israel, in peace preserved her land, her land of grace, where honest sportive mirth did always dwell, her holy holiness no tongue can tell, nations astonied at her happinesses, did grieve to lose her wisdom's worthiness, Judith the third that redelivered, the strong besieged city of Bethulia, and when the proud foe she had vanquished, and overcame hot-spurred Assyria, bringing in triumph Holofernes' head, she got a great and greater victory. Then thousand soldiers in their majesty, the first of Christians was fair Maud the Countess, Countess of Ania, daughter to a king, England's first Henry Almain's empress, heir in Dubite, and her father's offspring. She titles to the English crown did bring. She never desisted from the warlike field, till that usurped Stephen of Blois did yield, and condescended to her son's dear right, that warlike Maud had reobtained by might. The second was Elizabeth of Aragon, queen and wife to Honorable Ferdinando. She stoutly fought for propagation, of Christian faith, brought to subversion, the forsaken infidels of Granado, reducing that proud province all in what? to follow Christ's unspotted true religion. The last was Johane of Naples' true-born queen, sister to Ladislaus, king of Hungary, a woman that defended, as t'was seen, her country's great and gracious liberty, by force of laudable arms and chivalry, against the Saracens' invasion, and proud hot wars of princely Araga. Thus have I, in the honor of their worth, laid open their progeny, their deeds, their arms, their offspring, and their honorable birth. That is a lanthorn lightning their true fames, which truth can never burn in envy's flames. Worthy of wonder are these three times three, folded in brazen leaves of memory. Windsor a castle of exceeding strength, first built by Aruiragus, Britain's king, but finished by Arthur at the length, of whose rare deeds our chronicles do ring. And poets in their verse his praise do sing, for his round table and his warlike fight, whose valiantness the coward mind affright. This British king in wars a conqueror, and wondrous happy in his victories, was a companion of this noble order, and with his person graced these dignities, great dignities of high exceeding valor, for he himself the selfsame honor took, that all his following states did ever brook, this paragon whose name our time affright at Windsor Castle dubbed in one day, one hundred and just forty valiant knights, with his keen trusty sword, and only stay, called Dridwin, that his love did oversway, and with that sword the very day before, he slew as many Saxon foes or more, but English Edward third of memory, in blessed and religious zeal of love, built up a college of exceeding glory, that his kind care to England did approve, this college doth this castle beautify, the honor of the place is held so dear, that many famous kings are buried there, but one rare thing exceeding admirable, that to this day is held in great renown, and to all fourteen as is memorable, the name of which makes England's foes to frown, and pulls the pride of foreign nations down, knights of the Garter and St. George Cross, betokening to the foe a bloody loss, here followeth the birth, life, and death of Honorable Arthur, King of Britain, to the courteous reader. Courteous reader, having spoken of the first foundation of that yet renowned castle of Windsor by Adoriragus, King of Britain. Amp, finished by that succeeding prince of worthy memory, famous King Arthur. I thought good, being entreated by some of my honorable-minded friends, not to let slip so good and fit an occasion by reason that there yet remains in this doubtful age of opinions 
a controversy of that esteemed Prince of Britain, to write not according to age's oblivion, but directed only by our late historiographers of England, who no doubt have taken great pains in the searching forth of the truth of that first Christian worthy, and whereas I know not directed by what. Blindness. There have been some writers, as I think enemies to truth, that in their erroneous censures have thought no such may ever to be living. How fabulous that should seem to be. I leave to the judgment of the best readers, who know for certain, that that never-dead prince of memory is more beholding to the French, the Romain, the Scot, the Italian, yea, to the Greeks themselves, than to his own countrymen, who have fully and wholly set forth his fame and livelihood then, how shameless is it for some of us, to let slip the truth of this monarch. And for more confirmation of the truth, look but in the Abbey of Westminster at St. Edward's Shrine, there shalt thou see the print of his royal seal in red wax closed in beryl, with this inscription, Patricius Arthurus Galli, Germania, Dacia Imperator. At Dover likewise you may see Sir Gawain's skull and Craddock's mantle at Winchester, a city well known in England, his famous round table, with many other notable monuments too long to rehearse besides I myself have seen imprinted, a French pamphlet of the arms of King Arthur and his renowned valiant knights, set in colours by the heralds of France which charge of impression would have been too great, otherwise I had inserted them orderly in his life and actions, but gentle reader, take this my pains gratefully, and I shall hereafter more willingly strive to employ my simple wit to thy better gratulation. I have here set down, turned from French prose into English metre, the words of the herald under the arms of that worthy Briton. King Arthur in his warlike shield did bear. Thirteen rich crowns of purified gold. He was a valiant, noble conqueror, as ancient memory hath truly told. His great round table was in Britain, where chosen knights did do their homage yearly, the strange birth, honorable coronation, and most unhappy death of famous Arthur, king of Britain, of noble Arthur's birth, of Arthur's fall, of Arthur's solemn coronation of Arthur's famous deeds heroical, of Arthur's battles and invasion. And that high-minded worthy British king, shall my wit's memory be deify in the last time of you to surnamed Pendragon, so called for his witty policies, being a king of estimation, in famous Britain amongst his own allies. There was a mighty duke that governed Cornwall, that held long war, and did this king assail. This duke was named the Duke of Tintagel after these hot-bred wars were come to end. He sojourned at a place called Terrabil, from whence Pendragon for this duke did send, and being wounded sore with Cupid's sting, charged him his wife unto the court to bring, his wife a passing lady, lovely wife, chased to her husband's clear, unspotted bed, whose honour-bearing fame none could surprise, but Vesta like her little time she led, a green her name on whose unequal beauty, Pendragon doted, led by humane folly. At length he broke his mind unto a lord, a trusty counsellor and noble friend, that soon unto his mind's grief did accord, and his king's loving love thoughts did commend, telling Pendragon this should be his best, to tell the duchess of his sweet request. But she a woman, stern, inexorable, willing fond lusts enchantments to resist, all his tongue's smoothing words not penetrable. In her chaste bosom's gate could not insist, but straight she told her husband how she sped, lest that his grace should be dishonoured, and counselled him to pass away in haste, that night's dark dusky mantle might o'er a shade, their flying bodies, least at last they taste. More misery then time did e'er invade, for lust is such a hot inflamed thing, it governeth man's senses, rules a king, and as the duchess spake, the duke departed, that neither Uter nor his council knew, how his deep bosom's lord the duchess thwarted. But mark the story well what did ensue, soon as the king perceived their intent, intemperate rage made him impatient, away with music for your strings do ayar, your sound is full of discords, harsh and ill your diapason makes a humming war within mine ears, and doth my senses fill. 
With immelodious mourning, she is gone. That ruled yourselves and instruments alone. Away fond rhyming of it, lest thou write, of Prognay's murder or Lucretius' rape. Of Igrin's journey taken in the night, that in the black gloomed silence did escape. Oh, could no dog have barked, no cock have crowed, that might her passage to the king have showed. No mirth pleased you to but grim melancholy, haunted his heel, and when he sate to rest, he pondered in his mind Igrena's beauty, of whom his care crazed head was full possessed. Nothing was now contentive to his mind, but Igrena's name, Igreen to him unkind. At last his noble peers with pity mould, to see the king's sudden perplexity, with a great care that their liege emperor love, for to allay his great extremity, did counsel him to send for Garloy's wife, as he would answer it upon his life. Then presently a messenger was sent, to tell the duke of his wife's secret folly. This was the substance of his whole intent, to bring his wife to court immediately or within threescore days he did protest, to fetch him thither to his little rest, which when the duke had warning, straight he furnished, two castles with well-fenced artillery, with vitales and with men he garnished, his strongest holds for such an enemy, and in the one he put his heart's dear treasure, fairy green that he loved out of measure, that castle which the duke himself did hold, had many posterns out and issues thence, in which to trust his life he might be bold, and safely the war's fury to commence. But after telling time did wonders work, that foxes in their holes can never lurk. Then in all haste came Uta with his host, pitching his rich pavilions on the ground. Of his aspiring mind he did not boast, for love and anger did his thoughts confound. Hot war was made on both sides, people slain, and many death-door knocking souls complain, love and mind's anguish so perplexed the king, for he green that incomparable day, that Cupid's sickness pierced him with a sting, and his war's loud alarums overcame, Venus entreated Mars a while to stay, and make this time a sporting holiday. Then came Sir Orpheus, a most noble knight, and asked his king the cause of his disease, being willing in a subject's gracious right, you to Pendragon's mind in heart to please. Ah, said the king, Egreen doth captivate my heart and makes my senses subjugate. Courage, my gracious liege, I will go find that true divining prophet of our nation. Merlin the wise that shall content your mind and be a moderator in this action, his learning, wisdom, and unseen experience shall quickly give a salute for love's offense. So Ulfius at the length from him departed, asking for Merlin as he passed the way, who by great fortune's chance Sir Ulfius thwarted, as he went by in beggar's base array, demanding of the knight in basiness meek, who was the man he went so far to seek. Ulfius, amazed at his base attire, told him it was presumption to demand the name of him for whom he did inquire, and therefore would not yield to his command. Alas, said Merlin, I do plainly see, Merlin, you seek, that Merlin, I am he, and if the king will but fulfill my hest, and will reward my true deserving heart, in his love's agonies he shall be blessed, so that he follow what I shall impart, upon my knighthood he will honor thee, with favor and rewards most royal. Then Ulfius glad departed in all haste, and rode amain to King Pendragon's sight telling his grace Merlin he met at last, that like a lampe will give his lovelace light. Where is the man? I wished for him before. See where he stands, my liege, at yonder door. When you to saw the mat, a sudden joy and uncomprehended gladness filled his heart. With kind embracements met him on the way, and to him gan his secrets to impart. Leave off, quoth Merlin, I do know your mind. The fair-faced Lady Igraine is unkind, but if your majesty will hear protest, and swear as you are lawful king anointed, to do my will, nothing shall you molest, but follow my directions being appointed. I swear, quoth Uta by the evangelists, he dies for me that once thy will resist. Sir, said the prophet Merlin, this I crave, that shall betoken well whate'er betide, the first fair sportive night that you shall have, 
lying safely nuzzled by fair Igrinae's side. You shall beget a son whose very name, in after stealing time his foes shall tame. That child being born your grace must give to me, for to be nourished at my appointment. That shall redound much to his majesty, and to your grace's gracious good intent. That shall be done, quoth Merlin. Let's away, for you shall sleep with the grain, aunt be day. And as Jove stole to fair Alcmena's bed, in counterfeiting great Amphitria, by the same lust-directed line being led, to Igrina's lovely chamber must you go. You shall be like the duke her husband's greatness, and in his place possess her husband's sweetness. And you, my noble lord Sir Ulcius, shall be much like Sir Brustius of fate knight, and I will counterfeit the good Iordanus, and thus will pass together in the night. But see you question not, say you are diseased, and he to bed there shall your heart be pleased. But on the morrow do not rise, my liege, until I come to counsel for the best. For ten miles off, you know, doth lie the siege, that will not turn these night sports to a jest. Pendragon pleased hasted for to embrace, the sweetest got prey that ever king did chase. Soon as the Duke of Tintagel did perceive, that Uter left alone his royal army. He issued from his castle to bereave the soldiers of their lives by policy, but see his fortune by that wily train that he had laid for others he was slain. The subtil lust-directed king went on, masked in a strange devised new-found shape, to simple-minded Igreen unlike Pendragon. And three long hours lay in his lover's lap, there he begat the Christian king of kings, whose fame saster swans in pleasure sings. As soon as day betokening Phoebus' chariot had crossed his sister's wagon in the sky, Merlin in haste to Uta's chamber got, bidding good morrow to his majesty, and told him unrecalled time did stay, to haste him from his pleasure thence away. Uta, amazed with a grain in his arms, wished that the prophet had no use of tongue, whose doleful sound breathed forth these harsh alarms, and like the night crow croaked a deadly song. Ah, what a hell of grief, t'was to depart, and leave the new-got treasure of his heart. Then by the lawn-like hand he took his lover, being warmed with blood of a dissembling husband, desire in her cheeks she could not smother, and her love-dazzling eye none could withstand. He kiss her twice or thrice and bad adieu, as willing his knight's pleasure to renew. But when the late betrayed lady knew how that her true betrothed lord was slain, ere that night's reveling did first ensue, in secret to herself she wept amain, amazed and marvelling who that should be. That robbed her husband of his treasury, and to herself she gan for to relate the injuries of her unspotted life, and in her mind she loved disconsolate, banning her base bad fortune being a wife wishing for ever she had loved a maid, rather than her chaste thoughts should be betrayed, the noble counsel that attended Uta, began with gravity for to devise, that where their king had doted much upon her, her beauty his young thoughts to equalize, to knit them both in Hymen's sacred right, and then in lawful wise to taste delight, this motion made unto their sovereign, of a warm lusty stomach youthful blood, Fought it a heaven such a saint to gain, that would revive his spirits, do him good, and gave consent to have her honoured. With marriage rites the which were soon performed, half a year after as the king and queen, then growing great with child a bed were lying, the curtains drawn unwilling to be seen, this policy the king himself devising, asking whose child it was that she did bear. Speak gently green, tell me without fear. The queen amazed at this question, being fully wrapped in pale timidity, knew not to answer this sad action, because she fully knew her innocence. He urged her still, at length she waxed bold, and stoutly to the king the truth she told. With that he kissed his queen that was beguiled, and did recomfort her being half forlorn, telling, "'Twas he that did beget the child, the child that from her fair womb should be born." With that a sudden joy did repossess her pensive heart, whom fortune late did bless. Then Merlin, that did always love the king, as bearing chief affiance to his country, 
sought to provide for the child's nourishing, therein to show his well-disposed duty, as thou decrees said Uta, must it be. My dear son's fortunes I'll commit to thee. Well said the prophet, I do know a lord, a faithful passing true disposed man, that to your grace's pleasure will accord, and in your service do the best he can, commit your child unto his custody. A man renowned in famous Britain, his name Sir Hector send a messenger, to will him come unto the court with speed, and that your majesty must needs confer of matters helpful in a prince's need. When he is come, your grace may certify, you'll put your son and heir to his deliver, and when that fortune's child kind fortune's heir, for so the destinies prognosticate, shall be brought forth into the open air, that of fairy grain lately was begate, at yonder privy postern being unchristened, you must deliver it me to be baptized. As Merlin had devised, so twas done, for all the court to him did yield obeisance, and now Sir Hector to the king is come, and to Pendragon made his dear affiance, wishing his wife might nourish that bright sun, whose morning's glory was not yet begun. Then when the lovely queen was soon delivered, of that rich bearing burthen to her joy, the king himself in person hath commanded two ladies and two knights to bear the boy, bound up in cloth of gold being rich of state, and give it to the poor man at the gate, so Merlin had the prince at his disposing, committing it to Hector's faithful wife. Now nothing wanted but the sweet baptizing, to grace the prince of princes all his life. A holy reverend man endued with fame, Arthur of Britain called the prince's name, after the royal solemnation, of that black mournful weeping funeral, of Uta, that we name the great Pendragon. By subtle practice brought unto his fall, the sixteenth year of his victorious reign. By poison was this brave Pendragon slain, his body unto Stonehenge being brought. Hard by his brother Aurelius is he laid, in a fair monument then richly wrought. Dead is the king whose life his foes dismayed, but from his loins he left a son behind, the right idea of his father's mind. Great Arthur, whom we call the Britain's king, a man renowned for famous victories, Saxons and Pictus to homage he did bring, as you may read in ancient histories. Our later chronicles do testify King Arthur's noble mind in chivalry. Twelve noble battles did King Arthur fight against the Saxons' men of hardy strength, and in the battles put them still to flight, bringing them in subjection at the length. He never strove to drive them quite away, but straggling here and there he let them stay. In Southry, Kent, and Norfolk did they dwell still owing homage to King Arthur's greatness, whose puissance their pride did always quell, yet did he temper rigor with his meekness, and like a lion scorned to touch the lamb, where they submissive like unto him came, against the Pictes he held continual war, the which unto the Saxons were allied, and with the subtil Scot did always Zayar, who never true to Arthur would abide, but scorning his advancement to the crown, did think by force to pull his greatness down. The chiefest cause of this hot mortal strife that moved these kings to be dissentious was that the king of Pictus had tamed to wife. The eldest sister of Aurelius and Cornon king of Scots had married, their youngest sister to his princely bed, wherefore they thought the British regiment should have descended to the lawful heirs of Anna, wife to both in government and he as king to rule their great affairs, and do infer King Arthur's bastardy, and unjust claim to that high dignity, and presently they do dispatch in hast ambassadors to famous Britain, of their great peers for to demand at last the kingdom's crown and kingdom's royalty, who scorning for to hear a stranger name, crown King Arthur, whom the world hath famed, the coronation of King Arthur, and the solemnity thereof the proud message of the Romanes, and the whole resolution of King Arthur and his nobles. The appointed time and great solemnity approached of King Arthur's coronation, to which high states of mighty dignity, assembled at the city of Serliar, in Cassar's time called Herbs Legion, a title doubtless bearing some import, where many famous Britons did resort, 
to grace King Arthur whom the Britons loved, came three archbishops England's chief renown, both London, York, and do bright honour move, on Arthur's head to set the British crown, that after pulled the pride of nations down unto the palace of this princely king. They were conveyed where true-born fame did spring, do bright, because the court at that time lay within the compass of his diocese. In his own person on this royal day, richly to furnish him he did address, his love unto his king he did express, and at his hands the king was dignified. When our sees aloud, the people cried, This happy coronation being ended, the king was brought in sumptuous royalty, with all the people's hearts being befriended, to the cathedral church of that same see, being the metropolitical in nobility, with loud exclaiming joy of people's voice, that God might bless their land for such a choice. On either hand did two archbishops ride, supporting Arthur of Britannia, and four kings before him did abide, and Giselle king of stout Albania, and Cadul king of Venedosia, Cador of Cornwall these princes passed, and Sator of Demetia was the last. These four attired in rich ornaments, four golden swords before the king did bear, betokening four royal governments, and four true noble hearts not dreading fear, that envy from their breasts can never tear, before them played such well-tuned melody, that birds did sing to make it heavenly. King Arthur's queen unto the church was brought, with many noble peers being conducted, her arms and titles royally were wrought, and to her noble fame were garnished, that infamy had near diminished. Four queens before her bore four silver doves, expressing their true faith and husband's loves to brave King Arthur on this solemn feast. This day of high unspeakable dignity came four grave discreet persons of the best, from Rome's lieutenant, proud in majesty, carrying in token of their embassage, green olive boughs, and their dear liege's message, the epistle of Lucius Tiberius, the Romain lieutenant, to Arthur, king of Britain. Lucius Tiberius, Rome's great governor, to Arthur, king of large Britannia, as he deserveth favor at our hand. Rome and the Romain senators do wonder, and I myself exceedingly do mew, to think of thy audacious haughty mind, and thy tyrannical dealing to our state. Hot fiery anger boileth in my breast, and I am moved with honor of the cause, for to revenge thy injuries to Rome, and that like one nor proud of his estate, refuses to acknowledge her thy head, neither regardest speedily to redress thy base and blind oblivious oversight, and unjust dealing to offend the Senate, unto whose high imperial dignity, unless forgetfulness do blare thine eyes, thou knowest the whole huge circle of the world, a made contributory, and owe us homage, the tribute that the Britons ought to pay, the which the Senate did demand of thee, being due unto the Romain emperor, for that brave Julius Caesar had enjoyed, and many worthy Romanes many years, thou in contempt of us and our estate, our honorable estate and dignity, presumest injuriously for to detain, the confines of well-seated Gallia, the provinces of Savoy and Dolphine. With hot flamed fiery war hast thou subdued, and gotten in thy large possession. The islands of the bordering ocean, the kings whereof so long as we enjoyed them, paid tribute to our noble ancestors. The Senate, highly moved with thy presumption, determined for to redemand amends, and restitution for thy open wrongs. I therefore from the noble senators command thee on thy true allegiance, to row, to them, to me, and our estate, that in the midst of August next ensuing, thou do repair to Rome, therefore to answer, before the worthy senate and the lords, thy trespass, and abide arbitrament, such as by them shall there be ordered, and justice shall impose upon thy head, which thing if thou presumptuously refuse, I will forthwith invade thy territories, waste thy whole country, burn thy towns and cities, and whatsoe'er thy rashness hath detained, from Rome or from the Romain emperor, I will by dint of sword subdue again. Thus armed with hopeful resolution, we'll stay thy answer of submission. Lucius Tiberius, Cador the Duke of Cornwall his oration to the king, 
renowned Arthur and thrice worthy Britain, oh, how a lively blood doth fill my veins. At this proud message of the haughty Romains, I hitherto, my lord, have been in fear, lest that the worthy Britons with much ease and long continual peace and quietness should grow to too much sloth and cowardice and lose that honorable reputation of chivalry and martial discipline, wherein, right noble king, we have been counted for to surmount all nations of the world, for where the use of arms is not esteemed, but buried in oblivion's loathsome cave, and wanton dallying held in an estimate, it cannot choose but pale-faced cowardice, must dim and clean deface all worthy virtue. Five years have fully run their monthly course, since we put off our armor from our backs, or heard the trumpets clangor in our ears, or marched in triumph with the rattling drum, being nuzzled in effeminate delight, God willing that our names should not be blotted with the foul stain of beastly sluggardy, hath stirred up the proud insulting Romanes to wet our dull-edged swords not now in use, to cut their heads off in this rightful cause, and score our rusty armor long laid up, to buckle with so proud an enemy. Therefore, great Arthur, in thy greatness raise thy colors up, for to uprear thy praise, Cador Cornwall, the oration of King Arthur to his lords and followers, my fellows and my dear companions, both in the adverse chances of our age, and prosperous successful happiness, whose true unspeakable fidelity, in giving counsel touching wars abroad, and home-bred mutinies amongst ourselves, with good successfulness have I perceived, in your deep wisdoms and your gravity, afford me now your honorable aids, wisely foreseeing what you think convenient, touching the proud commandment sent from Rome, a thing at first carefully deliberated, is in the end most easily tolerated, we therefore shall with easier burden broke. The haughty message of Tiberius Lucius, if mongst ourselves in wisdom we confer, how and which way to answer his demand, and surely noble followers, I suppose. We have no cause to fear their foreign braves, for that upon a most unjust request. He seeks to have a tribute paid from Britain, because forsooth, in Julius Caesar's time, through jars and discords of the ancient Britons. The tribute hath been due and payable, for when our country was at full possess, with civil garboils and domestic brawls, their Caesar did arrive within this land, and with this armed soldiers full of force, brought in subjection that unquiet nation, by this allegiance they unjustly crave, tribute and satisfaction at our hands, for nothing that is got by violence may justly be possessed by violence, sith therefore he presumeth to demand, a thing being most unlawful at our hands. By the same reason let us demand of him, tribute at Rome morga their Romish power, and he that is the mightier in force, let him possess the honor of the tribute, for if his allegations and demands be forcible and worthy to be kept, because their Caesar and some Romain princes have sometimes conquered Britannia, by the like reason I do think that Rome ought to pay tribute and to do us homage, because my predecessors conquered it. Belin the noble king of Britain, with his brave brother Brennus' warlike aid, being then accounted Savoy's noble duke, raised the walls of Rome and set his standard, with victory upon the city gates, and in the middle of their marketplace, hung up twenty of their chiefest noblemen, and Constantine the son of Helena, and Maximinianus, my near cousins, were both enthronized in the imperial seat, and government of Rome's great empery, as touching France and other islands there, we need not answer their outbraving terms, for they refused to defend their own, when we by force redeemed them from their hands, then counsel me thrice worthy Britain peers, abandoning base cowardice and fears, King Arthur, the answer of Howell, king of Little Britain, though all your wisdoms and your gravities, handmaids to counsel and nobility, should be engraved in one golden leaf. More to the purpose could not you infer than thy most grave and exquisite oration. Thy eloquent and tully-like advice hath furnished us with such experiment, whereby we ought incessantly to praise in you the wisdom of a constant man, 
For if with all post-expedition you will prepare a voyage unto Rome, that do expect our haste and royal coming. According to the reasons you allege, I doubt not but that fair Victoria will sit in triumph on our conquering helms to fright the minds of Romish adversaries. Sith, we defend our ancient liberty, disdaining for to bear a servile yoke, which to this day the Britons do maintain. Let us go cheerfully and demand of them, with justice, what unjustly they demand. For he that doth deface another's right, and thinks unjustly for to dispossess, and take from him his own inheritance, deservedly, and with a worthy means, not violating large and hostile arms, may he be put from that which is his own, by him to whom the wrong is offered, seeing therefore that the Romains would usurp the royal dignity of worthy Britain, due to your honourable ancestor. I doubt not, noble king, but will regain that which your predecessors have possessed, even in the middle of their proudest city. If we may come to buckle with our foe, this is the conflict that true-hearted Britons so long have wished to happen to our age. These be the prophecies of wise Sibylla, long time ago plainly and truly told, and now at length fulfilled to our joy. That of the third race of the worthy Britons, there should be born a prince to repossess the Romish Empire and their dignity. For two of these the prophesy is past, in Belin and that worthy Constantine, who overcame and gave the arms of Rome. Now have we none but you, my gracious liege, the third and last, not least in all our eyes, to whom this high exploit is promised. Make haste, therefore, most royal sovereign, for to receive that which our God will give, hasten for to subdue their willing minds, which proffer up their honour to your hands. Hasten, dear liege, for to advance us all, that willingly will spend our lives and lands for the advancement of our liberty, and to achieve this labour-worthy king. Ten thousand armed soldiers will I bring, Howell, king of Little Britain, Angusel, king of Albania, his answer to the king. Since first I heard my sovereign speak his mind, full fraught with eloquence and learned counsel, a sudden joy did so possess my soul as that in words I cannot utter forth the explanation of my willing thought in all our victories and conquests won, subduing many regions, many kings, nothing at all in honour have we gained. If that we suffer the proud-minded Romanes and haughty Germains to usurp upon us, and do not now revenge those bloody slaughters enacted on our friends and countrymen, and Sith occasion now is proffered, and liberty to try our force of arms. I do rejoice to see this happy day, wherein we may but meet and join with them. I thirst, my lord, in heart for sweet revenge, as if three days I had been kept from drink. The wounds I should receive upon that day would be as pleasant to my labouring soul as water to a thirsty traveller, or else releasement to a man condemned. Nay, death itself were welcome to my bosom, for to revenge our father's injuries, defend our liberty, advance our king, let us give onset on that meacock nation, those fond, effeminate, unruly people, and fight it out unto the latest man, that after we have spread our waving colours, in sign of triumph and of victory, we may enjoy the honours they possess, and for my part, renowned valiant king, two thousand armed horsemen will I bring, Angusel king of Albania, a royal army Arthur hath provided to beard the braving Romanes in their country, and like a martialist hath them divided, to buckle with so proud an enemy, and courage joined with resolution, doth prick them forwards to this action. The Britons haughty and resolved men, stout, valiant, of Bologna's warlike brood, cheered on their followers and began again, for to revive their new decayed blood and to redeem to Arthur and his line. What once was won by valiant Constantine, now sounds his drummer march in cheerful sort. Now his loud winded trumpets check the air, and now the Britons to him do resort, not fearing war's affliction or despair, but all with one voice promise victory. To Arthur king of famous Brittany, his colours they are waving in the wind, wherein is wrought his arms of ancestry. His pendants are in formal wise assigned, 
quartered at large by well-read heraldry, cuffing the air that struggles for to kiss, the gordiness of fair King Arthur's bliss, within his spreading ensign first he bore, allotted from his royal family, three flying dragons and three crowns he wore, portrayed de or the field of azure die, his father's coat, his mother's country's grace, his honor's badge, his cruel foe's deface, at last unto himself he hath assumpted, and took to arms proper to his desire, as in his faithful mind being best accounted, and fitting to those thoughts he did require, a cross of silver in a field of vert, a gracious emblem to his great desert. On the first quarter of this field was figured, the image of Our Lady with her son, held in her arms, this he desired, wherein his new-grown valour was bygone, and bearing this same figure forth right nobly, did marvellous acts and feats of chivalry, this sign in elder ages being odious, and hated of the bad deserving mind, by his dear blood is made most precious, our unpure sin by him being full refined, a great triumphant sigh, a sign of joy, a blessed cross to free us from annoy, to this the righteous man bows down his head, and this the heavenly angels do adore, by this our unpure souls with life is fed, and devils fearing this do much deplore, hereon he vanquished Satha, hell, and sin, and by this signa our new life we begin, wise learned historiographers do write, that this pure sign of the most holy cross was sent from God to Mercury's delight. Julian the apostate's only loss, and that an angel brought to Mercury, all armor for his back most necessary, a shield of azure herein colored, a flowery cross between two golden roses, that the proud Jew's minds much distempered, whose virtue in itself true time encloses, a rich wrought shield and a most heavenly arm, that to the proud foe struck a deadly terror and in the time of Charles the seventh French king, the sun giving glory to the dim-faced moor, when early rising birds aloud did sing, and fair clear clouds the element did adorn. To Englishmen and French from heaven was sent a milk-white cross within the firmament, which heavenly sign of both these nations seen, the haughty French moved with rebellion, against their lawful king and true-born queen, began to yield their true submission and took it as a great admonishment, and sign betokening bitter detriment. Thus we may see that the religion, which they conceived of this blessed sight, altered their minds to veneration, and mollified their hearts then full of spite, yielding unto their prince obedience, and true submission for their great offence, the sight of honour to the French king's fame. They did behold a spectacle to France, at the same time when the third Edward came, and in the land his colours did advance, sending to Clodovius then their king, which there became a Christian by baptizing. He ex sunt francorum celebranda insignia regum, quae dimis apola, sustinet alma fide, et nobis coelica dona, et pia francorum placent insignia riga, aria coelesti primum sofulta colora, lilia, cesaris olim iam creditus seruit. Ori flamma de hinc, vetrum victoria regum. And ever since great Clodovius reign, they did remain as ensigns to that nation, where still before three toads they did sustain their only portraiture of commendation, by honour to the English kings pertaining, that conquered France when all their pride was waning. His barbed horses beat the yielding ground, and with their neighing terrified their foe proud of their riders in whose hearts are found, a promise to the Romaine's overthrow. The glistering shine of their well-fashioned armour tells all men here doth ride a conqueror, their armour strongly made and firmly wrought, not to the use of old decayed time, who with their gilded shows are good for naught, but like to stony walls not made with lime. The Britons went not proudly armoured, but strong as scorning to be conquered, in Callis he his colours doth advance, who all for fear do entertain this prince, and passeth through the regiment of France, and doth with puissance the French convince, still marching up to Paris and to Rhone, bringing that country in subjection, 
and having got his title and his name, a title got with famous victory. He marcheth forward to enlarge his fame, leaving fair France in his authority. By sword and clemency he conquered Ireland, and won by famous war the land of Gothland. Now more and more his army doth increase, and mighty kings do offer him their aid. So in the country they might live in peace, his warlike followers so their minds dismayed. The name of Arthur, king of Brittany, hath feared the Romish force from Italy. At last he comes to meet his enemy, high-hearted Lucius that his letters sent, to great Carleon with such majesty, that stiffly did demand a base intent. But now he wished King Arthur were away. For fear he lost the honor of the day. The Britain's valor was so admirable, As when a lion meeteth with his prey. King Arthur's courage so inestimable, That near a Romaine durst his strength assay, But like the dust with wind did take their flight, Yielding by war what they demand by might. Here lay a heap of Romans slaughtered, Trod underfoot by proud victorious steeds, and here one friend another murdered, notable for to help him in his need. Here bruised soldiers that aloud did cry, Brave Arthur, help us in our misery. And after he had won so great a field, and overthrew the Romaine Lucius, he pardoned those that graciously would yield, and leave their leader proud Tiberius, who left his men for fear and would not fight, but hid himself in darkness of the night. This base retreat and glorious victory, to Arthur's honor and Tiberius' shame, was spread through Rome, through France, through Italy. An exhalation to the British name, who foraged about, yet all did fly, till Arthur took them to his pitying mercy. Forward towards Rome these Britons make their way, sounding defiance as they pass along, their conquering ensigns still they do display, in arms and haughty courage passing strong. All cities offer peace, all towns submit, to Arthur's greatness as a thing most fit. But as they pass, huge Myrmidons do strive, surnamed giants, for to stop this king, and vow by paganism by which they thrive, his body in Oceanus to fling, and daunt his followers, who as fame hath said, of great big monstrous men were not afraid, at last they march upon a large broad plain. When first these haughty giants he doth spy, the Britons score for to retire again, but either win the honor or else die. Courage, quoth Arthur, better die with fame. Then yield or turn to our immortal shame. At length they meet, and meeting cope together. As when two savage boars are full of ire, the victory has yet inclined to neither. But from their crests and shields did sparkle fire, enkindled wrath from Arthur's breast hath sprung that he made passage through the thickest throng. The king of giants Arthur meets with awe, and copes with him for, in his strength, did stand. His kingdom's great advancement, or his fall, his subject's peace, his quietness of land. But this renown to Britain doth remain. The giant Arthur hand to hand hath slain, when he was down the rest, did faint for fear, which, when the British army had espied, their true-born valour did they not forbear, but all the green grass with their blood they died, and made such slaughter of these monstrous men, that after time hath registered again. After this conquest is King Arthur minded, with all his royal power to march to Rome, and with his lords he hath determined, this gallant resolution and this doom, to crown himself by war their emperor, and over all a mighty governor and had not fortune and rebellion stirred up his cousin Mordred's haughty mind, at home to make civil invasion, who sought King Arthur's glory for to blind, with honour had he re-enkindled fire, to burn the walls of Rome to his desire. But, O false Mordred, thou deceitful kinsman, begot of treason's hair, thus to rebel against thy noble nephew, who hath won. Cities and people towns that did excel, and all he did was for to glorify his royal kindred and his noble country. But thou some base-born haggard makest a wing against the princely eagle in his flight, and like a hissing serpent seekest to sting. The lion that did shield thee from despite, 
but now being wakened by his country's wrong. With war he means to visit you ere long. The news of this proud rebel in his land was like deep-piercing arrows at his heart. Intemperate rage did make them understand King Arthur's fury and fond Mordred's smart, who vowed revengement most unnatural. On him that sought to bring his friends to thrall, he sounds retrait with heart-swollen heaviness, that he must leave fair Rome unconquered and march eth through the land in quietness to be revenged on the usurper Mordred. At this sweet news of his departing thence, the remains praise the rebel's excellence. King Arthur heard at his return towards Britain how Mordred had proclaimed himself their king, those that resisted he by force hath slain. Unto their country's ground a gentle offering, and to the Saxon Cheldrica is allied, who landing to their lawful king denied. By force they drive King Arthur from the shore, and like rebellious monsters kill his men, which when he views, he strive more and more, and his great puissant strength renews again, and Morgri all the power they withstand. At Sandwich noble Arthur taketh land, and joining battle with his enemies, the traitorous rebels are discomfited, and Mordred all in hast away he flies by treason's bloody train and murther led, to gather power to renew the fight, urged forward by the Saxon Cheldric's spite, the noble Arthur in this conflict lost, some of his followers whom he loved too dear. The death of gentle Gorn grieved him most, as by his outward sorrow did appear. This Gorn was proud Mordred's lawful brother, legitimate by father and by mother, O mirror of true-born gentility fair map of honour in his gentle blood, that rather chose to love his noble country, and seek the means to do his life liege good, than to defend his kindred by that war, that made the son and most kind father Iyar. Kind gone, trusty worthy gentleman, beloved of Arthur, as deservedly, recording time thy faithfulness shall scan, and loyal truth wrapped up in memory shall say in thy king's quarrel being just. At last thou diedest, not in thy brother's trust. Thy gentle king prepared thy funeral, and laid thy body in a sepulchre, in thine own country richly done and royal, at rose whose ancestry shall still endure, and like a nephew mourned and wept for thee, grieving to loose British nobility. But to proceed in this unlucky fight, King Angusel was slain whom Arthur loved, a man in whom his country took delight, that never with home-bred treachery was moved. In false faith Scotland was his bones interred, to which before King Arthur him preferred. That unjust Mordred, mischief's nourisher, time's bad infamer, traitor to the state, of his whole country bounds the chief perturber, whose name to this day monks them grows in hate. Fled from the battle-getting ships he sailed, westward towards Cornwall, when his force was quailed. But when King Arthur heard of his departure, causing the refuse rebels for to fly, to make the way of his defense more sure, with speed he reinforced his royal army, with new supply of hardy men at arms, whose resolution feared no following harm. With his whole force he marcheth after him, where all the Kentish men rejoice to see. King Arthur's colors, whose rich pride doth dim, the fair-faced son in all his majesty, not resting till he came unto the place where Mordred was encamped for a spay, by Winchester a city of renown, the traitorous army of this Mordred lay, on whose proud gathered troop the sun did frown, foreshowing to his men a black-faced day, and so it proved before the selfsame night, Mordred and his best friends were slain in fight. At Camblain was this bloody battle ended, where fame achieving Arthur Four was wounded, with gallant Britain lords being attended, whose sword, Cool's Pridwin, many had confounded. Yet fortune's unseen immortality, sometime cuts down sprigs of a monarchy. At this day's doleful stroke of Arthur's death, the glorious shining sun looked pale and wane, and when this monarch loosed forth his breath, the Britons being amazed about him ran and with their nails did tear their flesh as under, that they had lost their king the world's great wonder. 
Over this little island he had reigned, the full just term of six and twenty years, when twelve most famous battles he obtained, as in our ancient chronicles appear, and in the churchyard of fair Glastonbury they held King Arthur's woeful obsequy, and in the time of Second Henry's days, between two pillars was his body found, that in his life deserves immortal praise, laid sixteen foot deep underneath the ground, because his Saxon foes whom he did chase, should not with swords his live less core deface, in the last year of Henry's royalty, more than six hundred after his burial, by the abbot of the house of Glastonbury, at last they found King Arthur's funeral. Henry de Blois the abbot's name they gave, who by the king's command did find the grave, the principal and chief occasion that moved King Henry for to seek the place was that a bath in Welsh division recorded Arthur's acts unto his grace, and in the foresaid churchyard that did sing that they should find the body of the king, and those that digged to find his body there after they entered seven foot deep in ground. A mighty broad stone to them did appear with a great leaden cross there to bound, and downwards towards the corpse the cross did lie. Containing this inscripted posy, Hicaeset sepultus in Clitus rex, Arthurus in insula oolonia, his body whose great acts the world recorded, when vital limitation gave him life, and fame's shrill golden trump abroad had founded. What wars he ended, what debate, what strife, what honor to his country, what great love, amongst his faithful subjects he did prove, was not in turn in sumptuous royalty with funeral pomp of kindred and of friends, nor closed in marble stone wrought curiously, nor none in mourning black his king attends, but in a hollow tree made for the nonce, they do enter King Arthur's princely bones, their outward habit did not show their mind, for many millions of sad weeping eye, in every street and corner you might find, some beating their bare breast, and some without cries, cursing and banning that proud Mordred soul that did by war his princely life control. The kings that were attendant on his train forgot their kingdoms and their royal crowns. Their high proud haughty hearts with grief were slain, struck in amaze with fortune's deadly frown, for they had lost their scepter, seat, and all, by princely Arthur's most unhappy fall. The trunk being opened, at the last they found. The bones of Arthur king of Britain, whose shinbone being set upon the ground, as may appear by ancient memory, reeked to the middle thigh within a span of a tall, proper, well-set, big-limed mat, and furthermore they found King Arthur's skull, of such great largeness that betwixt his eye, his forehead's space a span broad was at full, that no true historiographer denies, the forenamed abbot living in those days, saw what is written now to Arthur's praise, the print of tenny wounds in his head appeared, all grown together except only one, of which it seems this worthy Briton died, a true memorial to his loving nation, but that was greater far than all the rest, had it been lesser Britain had been blessed, in opening of the tomb they found his wife, Queen Guinevere interred with the king, the tresses of her hair as in her life, were finely plaited whole and glistering, the color like the most pure refined gold, which being touched straight turned into mold. Henry de Blois at the length translated, the bones of Arthur and his lovely queen, into the great church where they were interred, within a marble tomb, as oft was seen, of whom a worthy poet doth rehearse. This epitaph in sweet heroic verse, Hicaeset Arthurus flos regum, Gloria regni, quem mores, Probitas commendunt laude perenni. Johannes le landage antiquarage en coming funeral, in vita facta mortem qui regis Arthuri inclitissimi, Saxonicus totis qui fudit mate crento, termas and peperit spolise sibi nomen opimes, fulminio totis pictos qui contudit ons, in posuitque jugum scoti serusibus ingens, Qui tumidos gallos, germanos kik, feroces, patulit, and dacos bello confrigit aperto, denic mordredum medio qui sustulit elud. Monstra, 
horrendum ingens, dirum suumque tyrannum, hocia set extinctus monumento Arthurius alto, militiae clarum decus, and virtutis alumnus, gloria nunc quius, teram succumulatum ne, a three capeti, sublimia tecta tonanti, forsigitur gentis prole generosa Britanni, induperatorita magno asurgi de vestro, et tumulo sacro roseas inferte corollas, officige testis redolentia munera vestri. Thus, English, he that so oft the Saxon troops did foil, and got a name of worth with riches spoil, he that with brandished sword the picks destroyed, and yoked the Scots their stubborn necks annoyed, he that the lofty French and Germans fierce did smite, and Dacian's force with war did vanquish quite, he lastly which cut off that monster Mordred's life, a cruel tyrant, horrible, mighty, full of strife, Arthur lies buried in this monument. War's chiefest garland, virtue's sole intent, whose glory through the world still swiftly flies, and mounts with fame's wings up to the thundering skies, you gentle offspring of the Britain's blood, unto this puissant emperor do honours good, and on his tombe lay garlands of sweet roses, sweet gifts of duty, and sweet loving posies, finis epitaphage, no, Arthur, the true pedigree of that famous worthy King Arthur, collected out of many learned authors, Twelve men in number entered the Vale of Avalon. Joseph of Arimathea was the chiefest, we confess. Chose the son of Joseph, his father, did attend on. With other ten, these Glaston did possess. Hilarius, the nephew of Joseph, first begate. Josue the wise, Josue Aminadab. Aminadab Castellus had by fate. Castellus got Manael, that lovely lad. And Manael by his wife had fair-faced Lambard with another dear son surnamed Erlard. And Lambard at the length begot a son, that had a green born of his wife. Of this Egrain, Uta the great Pendragon, begot King Arthur famous in his life, whereby the truth this pedigree doth end. Arthur from Joseph's loins did first descend, Peter cousin to Joseph of Arimathea, being sometimes king of great Arcadia, begat Erlan that famous worthy prince, and Erlan gat Melianus, that did convince. His neighbor foes, Melianus did beget. Edor, and Edor Lothos name did set, that took to wife the sister of King Arthur, a virgin fair, chaste, lovely, and most pure, of whom this Lotho had four lovely boys, their father's comfort and their mother's joys, Walwanus, Agrinias, Garlus, and Garili, that in their country much did sovereignize, all which were men of great authority and famous in the land of Britain. Here endeth the birth, life, death, and pedigree of King Arthur of Britain, and now, to where we left. Phoenix, O oh, nature, tell me one thing ere we part, what famous town and situated seat is that huge building that is made by art, against whose walls the crystal streams do beat, as if the flowing tide the stones would eat, that lies upon my left hand built so high that the huge top-made steeple dares the sky. Nature, that is the Britain's town old Troynuant, the which the wandering Trojan son did frame, when after shipwreck he a place did want, for to revive his honour-splitted name, and raised again the cinders of his fame, when from Sidonian Dido they did steal, to rear the pillars of a common wheel, since when to come more nearer to our time, Lud the great king did with his wealth enlarge, the famous builded city of this clime, and Ludstone to be called he gave in charge, and London now that town is grown at large, the flowing river Thamasis is named, whose sea ensuing tide can near be tamed. Phoenix, O London, I have heard thee honoured, and thy name's glory raised to good intent. Law's council chamber in thy walls is bred, the school of, of knowledge and experiment, wise senators to govern thee, is lent all things to beautify a royal throne, where scarcity and dearth did never groan. Nature, leave off thy praises till we have more leisure, and to beguile the weary lingering day, whose long-drawn hours do tire us out of measure. Our cunning in love songs let us assay, and paint our pleasure as some good array. I will begin my cunning for to taste, and your experience we will try at last. 
Here nature singeth to this ditty following. What is love but a toy to beguile men's senses? What is Cupid but a boy, boy to cause expenses? A toy that brings to fools a press thrall, a boy whose folly makes a number four. What is love but a child, child of little substance, making apes to be wild, and their pride to advance? A child that loves with gewgaws to be toying, and with thin shadows always to be playing. Love is sweet, wherein sweet. In fading pleasures, wanton toys, love a lord, and yet meet, to cross men's humours with a noise, a bitter pleasure pleasing for a while. A lord is love that doth man's thoughts beguile. Oh, sing no more, you do forget your theme, and have profaned the sacred name of love. You dip your tongue in an unwholesome stream, and from the golden truth your notes remove. In my harsh ditty I will all reprove, and unaccustomed I will try my skill to pleasure you and to confute your will. The phoenix her song to the ditty before, O holy love, religious saint, man's only honey-tasting pleasure, thy glory learning cannot paint, for thou art all our worldly treasure. Thou art the treasure, treasure of the soul, that great celestial powers dost control. What greater bliss then to embrace, the perfect pattern of delight, whose heart-enchanting eye doth chase all storms of sorrow from man's sight. Pleasure, delight, wealth, and earth joys do lie in Venus' bosom, bosom of pure beauty. That mind that tasteth perfect love is far remoted from Manoy, Cupid that God doth sit above, that tips his arrows all with joy, and this makes poets in their verse to sing. Love is a holy, holy, holy thing. Nature, O voice angelical, O heavenly song, the golden praise of love that thou hast made, delivered from thy sweet smoothed honeyed tongue, commands love's self to lie within a shade, and yield thee all the pleasures may be had. Thy sweet melodious voice hath beautified, and gilded love's rich amours in her pride. Phoenix, enough, enough, love is a holy thing, a power divine, divine, majestical, in shallow-witted brains as you did sing. It cares not for the force material, and low-born swains it naught respects at all. She builds her bower in none but noble minds, and there due adoration still she finds. Nature, stay, Phoenix, stay, the evening star draws near, and Phoebus he is parted from our sight, and with this wagon mounted in the sky, affording passage to the gloomy night. That doth the wayfaring passenger affright, and we are set on foot near to that isle, in whose deep bottom plains delight doth smile. Phoenix, oh, what a music sent the air doth cast, as if the gods perfumed it with sweet myrrh. Oh, how my blood's inspired and doth taste, an alteration in my joints to stir, as if the good did with the bad confer. The air doth move my spirit, purge my sense, and in my body, doth new war commence. Look round about, behold you fruitful play, behold their meadow plots and pasture ground, behold their crystal rivers run amain, into the vast huge sea's devouring sound, and in her bowels all her filth is found. It vomiteth by virtue all corruption, into that watery plain of desolation. And while the day gives light unto our eyes, be thou attentive, and I will relate the glory of the plains that thou descries, whose fertile bounds far doth extenuate, where Mars and Venus arm in arm have sat, of plants of herbs, and of high springing trees, of sweet, delicious savours, and of bees, in this delightsome country there doth grow, the mandrake called in Greek mandragoras, some of his virtues if you look to know, the juice that freshly from the root doth pass purgeth all fleam like black helebras. Tis good for pain engendered in the eyes, by wine made of the root doth sleep arise. There's yellow cowbells and the daffodil, good Harry, Herb Robert, and white cotula. Adder's grass, eglanty, and aphodil, Agnes Castus, and acacia, the black archangel Coloquintida, sweet sugar canes, sink foil and boy's mercury, goosefoot, gold snap, and good gratia day. Moss of the sea, and yellow succory, sweet trefoil, 
weed wind, the wholesome wormwood, muskmelons, mustale, and mercury, the dead archangel that for when is is good, the soldier's pero, and great southernwood, stone heart's tongue, blessed thistle, and sea trifoli, our lady's cushion, and Spain's pellitory, phoenix, no doubt this climate whereas these remain, the women and the men are famed for fair, here need they not of aches to complain, for physics skill grows here without compare, all herbs and plants within this region are, but by the way sweet nature as you go, of Agnes Castus speak a word or two, nature, that shall I briefly, it is the very handmaid, to you Esther, or to perfect chastity. The hot inflamed spirit is allayed by this sweet herb that bends to luxury. It drieth up the seed of venery, the leaves being laid upon the sleeper's bed. With chasteness, cleanness, pureness he is said, Burn me the leaves, and straw then on the ground, where a soul venomous serpents used to haunt. And by this virtue here they are not found, their operation doth such creatures daunt. It causeth them from thence for to avaunt. If thou be stung with serpents great or less, drink but the seed, and thou shalt find redress. But to proceed, here's clary, or clear eye, calus snout, cuckoo flowers, and the cuckoo's meat, calathian violets, dandelion, and the dewberry, leopard's foot, and green spinach which we use to eat, and the hot Indian sun procuring heat, great wild valeria, and the withy wind the watercresses, or egg-curing woodbine, there's foxglove, forget-me-not, and coleander, gullingle, gold-cups, and buprestis, small honesty, eye-bright, and coculus panter, double-tongue, mole, and the bright anthillis, smelling clower, and aethiopis, floramor, euphorbium, and isula, white bulbous violet, and cassia fistula, phoenix. But by the way, sweet nature, tell me this, is this the moly that is excellent, for strong enchantments and the adder's hiss? Is this the moly that Mercurius sent to wise Ulysses when he did prevent the witchcraft and foul Circe's damned charms that would have compassed him with twenty harms? Nature, this is the moly growing in this land that was revealed by cunning Mercury to great Ulysses, making him withstand the hand of Circe's fatal sorcery that would have loaden him with misery. And here we pass, I'll show some excellence, of other herbs in physics, noble science, there mugwort, cena, and tithemales, oak of Jerusalem, and lyricum forci, lark's spur, lark's claw, and lentiles, garden nigella, mill, and pione, woody nightshade, mints, and centauri, sobread, dragons, and goats, Oregon, pelemir, hellebore, and osmond the waterman. First of this mugwort it did take the name of Artemisia wife to Mausoleus, whose sun-bred beauty did his heart inflame. When she was queen of Helicarnassus, Diana gave the herb this name to her, because this virtue to us it hath lent. For women's matters it is excellent. And he that shall this herb about him bear is freed from hurt or danger anyway. No poisoned toad, no serpent shall him fear. As he doth travel in the sunshine day, no weariness his limbs shall aught assay, and if we wear this mugwort at his breast, being travelling, he never shall covet rest. There is black hellebore called melampodium, because an Arcadian shepherd first did find this wholesome herb Melampus named of some, which the rich Proetus daughter's wits did bind, when she to extreme madness was inclined. It cured and revived her memory. That was possessed with a continual frenzy, their centre in Greek centurion, that from the centaur Chiron took the name. In Spain t'was called Centauria long ago, and this much honour must we give the same. Wild tigers with the leaves a man may tame. Tis good for sin-wed aches, and gives light to the black misty dimness of the fight. Fame's golden glory spreadeth this report upon a day that Chiron was a guest to Armstrong Hercule, and did resort unto his house to a most sumptuous feast, and welcome was the centaur amongst the rest. But see his luck, be on his foot let fall, great Hercules shaft, and hurt himself withal, a mighty arrow not for him to wield.
the wound being deep, and with a venomed point, to death's arrestment he began to yield, and there with sundry balms they did anoint, his wounded foot being strucken through the joint, all would not serve till that an old man brought. The century that ease to him hath wrought, there's Osman Balapade, Plebay, and Oculus Christi, sleeping nightshade, Salomon's seal, and Sampire, sage of Jerusalem, and sweet rosemary, great Pilocella, Sengreen, and Alexander, knight's milfoil, mastic, and stockilofer, heart's ease, herb tupin, and hermodactyl, narcissus, and the red flower pimpernel, phoenix, that word narcissus is a force to steal, cold running water from a stony rock, alas, poor boy, thy beauty could not heal, the wound that thou thyself too deep didst look, thy shadowed eyes, thy perfect eyes did mock, false beauty said true beauty from the deep, when in the glassy water thou didst peep, O love, thou art imperious, full of might, and dost revenge the cry-disdaining lover. His looks to ladies' eyes did give a light, but pride of beauty did his beauty smother. Like him for fair you could not find another. Ah, had he loved, and not on ladies lower. He near had been transformed to a flower. Nature, this is an emblem for those painted faces, where divine beauty rests her for a while, filling their brows with storms and great disgraces, that on the pain soul yields not a smile, but puts true love into perpetual exile. Hard-hearted soul, such fortune light on thee, that thou mayst be transformed as well as he. Ah, had the boy been pliable to be won, and not abused his morn excelling face, he might have lived as beauteous as the sun, and to his beauty ladies would give place. But, O oh, proud boy, thou wrought'st thine own disgrace. Thou lovest thyself, and by the self-same love didst thy divinize to a flower remove. But to proceed, there's Christi Oculus. The seed of this hormonum drunk with wine doth stir a procuration's heat in us, and to libidinous lusts makes men incline, and men's unable bodies doth refine. It brings increase by operation, and multiplies our generation. There's carrots, cheruile, and the cucumber, red patience, purslane, and gingidia, oxi, sheep-killing pennygrasses, and the golden flower, coca pintel, our lady's seal, and sargapenum, theophrastus violet, and vinstoxicum, St. Peter's wort, and lovely Venus hair, and squilla, that keeps men from soul despair. Oh, this word carrots, if a number knew the virtue of thy rare excelling root, and what good help to men there doth ensue, they would their lands and their lives sell to boot, but thy sweet operation they would view, sad dreaming lovers slumbering in the night, would in thy honey working take delight, the Thracian Orpheus whose admired skill, infernal Pluto once hath ravished, causing high trees to dance against their will, an untamed beast with music's harp hath said, and fishes to the shore hath often led, by his experience oftentimes did prove, this root procured in maids a perfect love, purslane doth comfort the inflamed heart, and healeth the exulcerated kidneys, it stoppeth all defluxions falling smart, and when we sleep expelleth dreams and fancies, it drives imaginations from our eyes, the juice of purslane hindereth that desire, when men to Venus games would fain aspire, there's rocket, Jack by the hedge, and love in idleness, night's water sangrene, and silver maiden here, Paris now's tornasol, and town cresses, star thistle that for many things is dear, and sayer that in Italy corn doth bear, wake robins, hyacinth, and hartichocker, Latus, that men's sense of sleep doth rock, phoenix, O oh poor boy hyacinthus, thy fair face, of which Apollo was enamoured brought thy life's lord too timely to that place, where playing with thee thou wast murdered, and with thy blood the grass was sprinkled. Thy body was transformed in that hour into a red-white mingled gilly flower. Nature, but yet Apollo wept when he was slain, for playing with him clean against his will. He made him breathless, this procured his pain. True love doth seldom seek true love to kill. O love thou many actions dost fulfill. Search, seek, 
and learn what things there may be shown, then say that love's sweet secrets are unknown, and as a token of Apollo's sorrow, a silver-colored lily did appear, the leaves his perfect sighs and tears did borrow, which have continued still from year to year, which shows him loving, not to be severe. A, A is written as a morning dit, upon this flower which shows Apollo's pit, O oh, schoolboys, I will teach you such a shift, as will be worth a kingdom when you know it, an herb that hath a secret hidden drift. To none but Tresvans do I mean to show it, and all deep reed physicians will allow it. Oh, how you play the wags, and fain would hear, some secret matter to allay your fear. There's garden rocket, take me but the seed, when in your master's brow your faults remain, and when to save yourselves there is great need. Being whipped or beaten, you shall feel no pain. Although the blood your buttocks seem to stain, it hardeneth so the flesh and tender skin, that what is seen without comes not with it. The father that desires to have a boy, that may be heir unto his land and living, let his espoused love drink day by day. Good artichokes, who buds in August spring, sod in clear running water of the spring. Wives natural conception it doth strengthen and their declining life by force doth lengthen. In summer time, when sluggish idleness doth haunt the body of a healthful man, in winter time, when a cold, heavy slowness doth tame a woman's strength, do what she can, making her look both bloodless, pale, and wan. The virtue of this artichoke is such, it stirs them up to labor very much. There's Sobred, Stanwart, and Star of Jerusalem base or flat for ruin, and the wholesome tansy, go to bed at noon, and titumalup, hundred-headed thistle, and tree-clasping ivy, stalk-spill, great stone-crop, and seed of canary, dwarf gentian, snakeweed and summer savory, bell-rags, prickly box, and raspis of coventry. This so bred is an herb that's perilous, for howsoever this same root be used, for women grown with child, tis dangerous and therefore it is good to be refused, unless too much they seek to be misused. Oh, have a care how this you do apply, either in inward things or outwardly, those that about them carry this same sobread, or plant it in their gardens in the spring, if that they only over it do tread. Twill kill the issue they about them bring, when Mother Lullaby with joy should sing. Yet wanton scaping maids perhaps will taste this unkind herb and snatch it up in haste. Yet let me give a warning to you all. Do not presume too much in dalliance. Be not short-held with every wind to fall. The eye of heaven perhaps will not dispense with your rash fault, but plague your foul offense, and take away the working and the virtue, because to him you broke your promised duty. There's Ive that doth cling about the tree, and with her leafy arms doth round embrace. The rotten hollow withered trunk we see, that from the maiden scissors took that place, grape crowned Bacchus did this damsel grace. Love piercing windows dazzled so her eye, that in love's over kindness she did die. A rich wrought sumptuous banquet was prepared, unto the which the gods were all invited. Amongst them all this scissors was ensnared, and in the sight of Bacchus much delighted. In her fair bosom was true love united. She danced and often kiss him with such mirth. That sudden joy did stop her vital breath, as soon as that the nourisher of things. Our grander mirth had tasted of her blood, from forth her body a fresh plant there spring. And then an ivy-climbing herb there stood, that for the flux dysentery is good, for the remembrance of the god of wine, it therefore always clasps about the vine. There is angelica, or dwarf gentian, whose root being dried in the hot shining sun, from death it doth preserve the poisoned man, whose extreme torment makes his life half gone, that from death's mixed potion could not shun, no pestilence nor no infectious air, shall do him hurt or cause him to despair. There's Carduus Benedictus called the blessed thistle, Nesworth, Pennyroyal, and Astrolochia, Yellow Wolf's Bane, and Rose-Smelling Bramble, Our Lady's Bedstraw, Brooklight, and Lunaria, Cinque foil, cat's tail, and cresse sciatica, hollyhocks, moussier, and petit morel, sage, 
Scorpiades, and the garden sorrel. First of the nesswort, it doth drive away, and poisoneth troublesome mice and long-tailed rats, and being sod in milk, it doth destroy bees, wasps, or fly, and little stinging gnats. It killeth dogs, and rest disturbing cats. Boiled with vinegar it doth assuage, the ache proceeding from the tooth's hot rage. Sage is an herb for health preservative. It doth expel from women barrenness. Hia saith, it makes the child to live, whose new knit joints are full of feebleness, and comforteth the mother's weariness, adding a lively spirit that doth good unto the painful laboring wives' sick blood. In Egypt, when a great mortality and killing pestilence did infect the land, making the people die innumerable. The plague being ceased, the women out of hand, did drink of juice of sage continually, that made them to increase and multiply, and bring forth store of children presently. This herb lunaria, if a horse do graze, within a meadow where the same doth grow, and over it doth come with gentle pace, having a horse lock at his foot below, as many have, that safeguard we do know, it openeth the lock, and makes it fall. Despite the bar that it is locked withal, there's standergras, hares, bullocks, or great orchards, provoketh Venus, and procureth sport. It helps the weakened body that's amiss, and falls away in a consumption sort. It heals the hectic fever by report, but the dried shrived root being withered, hindereth the virtue we have uttered. If man of the great springing roots doth eat, being in matrimonial copulation, male children of his wife he shall beget. This special virtue hath the operation, if women make the withered roots their meat. Fair lovely daughters, affable and wise, from their fresh springing loins there shall arise. There's rosemary, the Arabians justify, physicians of exceeding perfect skill. It comforteth the brain and memory, and to the inward sense gives strength at will. The head with noble knowledge it doth fill, conscrews thereof restores the speech being lost, and makes a perfect tongue with little cost. There's dwale or nightshade, tis a fatal plant. It bringeth men into a deadly sleep, then rage and anger doth their senses haunt. And like mad Ajax they a coil do keep, till lean faced death into their heart doth creep. In our main grave experience hath us thought, this wicked herb for many things is naught. Oak of Jerusalem being thoroughly dried, and laid in presses where your clothes do lie. No moths or venom amongst them shall abide. It makes them smell so odoriferously, that it doth kill them all immediately. It helps the breast that's stopped with corruption, and gives man's breath fit operation. Phoenix, blessed be our mother earth that nourisheth. In her rich womb the seed of times increase, and by her virtue all things flourisheth, when from her bosom she doth them release. But are there plants and trees in this fair isle, where Flora's sweet-spread garden seems to smile? Nature, as plentifully unto these islanders, are the fruit-bearing trees, as be the flowers, and to the chiefest lords that are commanders. They serve as pleasant overshading bowers, to banquet in the day and sport being late. And most of them I mean to nominate. There's the great sturdy oak and spreading vine, under whose branches Bacchus used to sleep, the rose tree and the lofty bearing pine, that seems being touched with wind, fall off to weep. The hawthor, crest's thorn and the rosemary, the tamarisky, willow, and the almond tree, the most chaste tree, that chasteness doth betoken, the holly home, the cork, and gooseberry, that never with tempestuous storms is shooken, the olive, filbert, and the barberry, the mastic tree whose liquid gum being dried, is good for them that Reum hath terrified, there's Judas tree, so called because that Jew, that did betray the innocent Lamb of God, there first of all his sorrows to renew, did hang himself, plagued with a heavy rod, a just reward for such an unjust slave that would betray his master to the grave. There's ash tree, maple, and the sycamore, pomegranate, apricocks, and juniper, the turpentine that sweet juice doth deplore, the quince, the pear tree, and the young man's medlar, the fig tree, orange, 
and the sweet moist lemon, the nutmeg, plum tree, and the lovely citra. Now for the myrtle tree it bears the name. Being once the god's pallor's best beloved, of Mersin, the young fair Athenian dame, because in activeness she much excelled, the lusty young men of Athenia, she still was honoured of the wise Minerva, who willing her at tilt and tournament, at running, vaulty, and activity, and other exercise of government, not to be absent from her deity, because that she as judge might give the crown and garland to the victor's great renown, but no forepast age was free from envy, that spiteful honour crazing enemy, for on a time giving the equal glory to him that won it most deservedly. The vanquisher in fury much displeased, slew Mersin whom the goddess favoured. Pallas offended with their cruelty, did gratefully revenge her maiden's death, transforming her into a myrtle tree, sweetly to flourish in the lower earth. The berries are a means for to redress, being decocted, swollen-faced drunkenness. The stormy winter's green remaining bay was Daphne, Ladon, and the earth's fair daughter, whom wise Apollo haunted in the day, till at the length by chance, alas, he caught her. Oh, if such faults were in the gods above, blame not poor silly men if they do love, but she not able, almost out of breath. For to resist the wise god's humble suit made her petition to her mother earth that she would succor her and make her mute. The earth, being glad to ease her misery, did swallow her and turned her to a bay tree. Apollo, being amazed at this sight, named it Daphne for his Daphne's honor, twisting a garland to his heart's delight. And on his head did wear it as a favor, and to this day the bay tree's memory remains as token of true prophesy. Some of the heathen, men of opinion, suppose the green-leaved bay tree can resist enchantment, spirit, and illusion, and make them seem as shadows in a mist. This tree is dedicate only to the sun, because her virtue from his vice bygone. The mose tree hath such great large spreading leaves that you may wrap a child of twelve months old in one of them, unless the truth deceives, for so our herborists have truly told by that great city Aleph in Assyria. This tree was found hard by Venetia, the fruit hereof, the Greeks and Christians, that do remain in that large spreading city. The misbelieving Jews and Persians hold this opinion for a certainty. Adam did eat in lively paradise, that wrapped man's freeborn souls in miseries. Phoenix, these trees, these plants, and this description of their sweet liquid gums that are distilling, are to be held in estimation, for fair face Tellus glory is excelling, but what white silvered rich resembling plain? Is that where woody moving trees remain? Nature. That is the warty kingdom of Neptunus, where his high wood made towers daily flute, bearing the title of Oceanus, as honey speaking poets oft do quote, and as the branches spreading from the tree. So do the rivers grace this lovely country wherein is bred for man's sweet nourishment, fishes of sundry sorts and diverse natures, that the inhabitants doth much content as a relievement to all mortal creatures. But for to make you perfect what they be, I will relate them to you orderly. There swims the gentle prawn and pickerel, a great devourer of small little fish, the puffet, sole, and summer-loving mackerel, in season held for a high lady's dish the big-boned whale, of whom the skillful mariner, sometimes God knows, stands in a mighty terror. The music-loving dolphin here doth swim, that brought Arion on his back to shore, and stayed a long while at the sea's deep brim, to hear him play, in nature did deplore, as being loth to leave him, but at last, headlong himself into the sea he cast. Here swims the ray, the sea-calf and the porpoise, that doth betoken rain or storms of weather, the seahorse, sea how, and the wide-mouthed plas, a spitchcoke, stockfish, and the little pilcher, whose only moisture pressed by cunning art, is good for those troubled with aches smart. Here swims the shad, the spitfish, and the spurling, the thornback, a turbot, and the periwinkle, the twy, the trout, the scallop, and the whiting, the skate, the roch, the tench, and pretty wrinkle. 
the purple fish, whose liquor usually, a violet color on the cloth, doth die. Here swims the perch, the cuttle, and the stockfish. That with a wooden staff is often beaten. The crab, the perch, which poor men always wish. The rough, the piper good for to be eaten. The barbell that three times in every year, her natural young ones to the waves doth bear. Phoenix, his great divine omnipotence is mighty. That rides upon the heaven's axle tree, that by increase amongst us sends such plenty if to his mightiness grateful we will be. But stubborn-necked Jews do him provoke, till he do load them with a heavy yoke. Nature, truth have you said, but I will here express. The riches of the earth's hid secrecy, the salt seas unseen, unknown worthiness, that yields us precious stones innumerable, the rattenness of their virtue fit for kings, and such this country climate often brings. Herein is found the amethyst and abstone, the topaz, turches, and gelatia, the adamant, dionese, and chalcedon, the beryl, marble, and elutropia, the ruby, sapphire, and asterites, the hyacinth, sardonyx, and argorite, the smaragd, carbuncle, and alablaster, cornelis, chrysopas, and coral, the sparkling diamond, and the lovely jasper, the margarite, lodestone, and the bright-eyed crystal, ligurious, onyx, nitrop, and gagates, abscistos, amatites, and the good achates. Here, in this island, are there mines of gold, mines of silver, iron, tin, and lead, that by the laboring workmen we behold, and mines of brass, that in the earth is fed, the stone liparia, galactites, and pantaron, enedros, iris, Dracontites and Astrion, the adamant, a hard obdurate stone, invincible and not for to be broken, being placed near a great big bar of iron. This virtue hath it as a special token. The lodestone hath no power to draw away. The iron bar but in one place doth stay, yet with a goat's warm, fresh and lively blood, this adamant doth break and rive in sunder. That many mighty huge strokes hath withstood. But I will tell you of a greater wonder. It reconciles the woman's love being lost, and giveth proof of chasteness without cost. The purple colored amethyst doth prevail against the wit oppressing drunkenness, if evil cogitations do assail. Thy sleepy thoughts wrapped up in heaviness, it soon will drive them from thy mind's disturbing, and temporize thy brain that is offending. The white veined interlined stone achates, bespotted here and there with spots like blood, makes a man gracious in the people's eyes, and for to clear the sight is passing good. It remedieth the place that's venomous, and in the fire smells odoriferous. The gem amatites hath this quality. Let a man touch his vesture with the same, and it resisteth fire mightily. The virtue doth the force of burning tame, and afterwards cast in the fire's light. Burns not at all, but then it seems most bright. The fair stone beryl is so precious that mighty men do hold it very rare. It frees a man from actions perilous, if of his life's dear blood he have a care. And now and then being put into the eyes, descends a man from all his enemies. The stone seranicum spotted o'er with blue, being safe and chastely borne within the hand, thunders hot raging cracks that do ensue. It doth expel, and lightnings doth withstand, defending of the house that many keep, and is effectual to bring men asleep. The diamond the world's reflecting eye, the diamond the heaven's bright shining star, the diamond the earth's most purest glory, and with the diamond no stone can compare. She teaketh men to speak, and men to love, if all her rarest virtues you will prove. The diamond taught music first his cunning, the diamond taught poetry her skill. The diamond gave lawyers first their learning. Arithmetic the diamond taught at will. She teaketh all arts for within her eye. The knowledge of the world doth safely lie. Dradikos is a stone that's pale and wan. It brings to some men thoughts fantastical. It being laid upon a cold dead man, loseth the virtue it is graced with all. Wherefore tis called the most holy stone. For... Whereas death frequenteth it is gone, 
A kite's is in color violet, found on the banks of this delight some place, both male and female in this land we get, whose virtue doth the princely eagle grace, for being born by her into her nest. She bringeth forth her young ones with much rest, this stone being bound fast to a woman's side, within whose purest womb her child is lie, doth hasten childbirth, and doth make her bide. But little pay, her humours is releasing. If any one be guilty of deceit, this stone will cause him to forsake his meat. Enidros is the stone that's always sweating, distilling liquid drops continually, and yet for all his daily moisture melting, it keeps the self-same bigness steadfastly, it never lessineth, nor doth fall away, but in one steadfast perfectness doth stay. Perpetui flitus lachrimas distillat enidros, qui valut ex pleni fontis caturigine manat, gagates smelling like to frankincense, being left whereas the poisonous serpents breed, drives them away, and doth his force commence, making this beast on barren plains to seed, and there to starve and pine away for meat, because being there he finds no food to eat. This stone being put in a fair woman's drink will testify her pure virginity, a most rare thing that some men never think, yet you shall give your judgment easily. For, if she make her water presently, then hath this woman lost her honesty. The jacinth is a neighbor to the sapphire, that doth transform itself to sundry sights, sometimes tis black and cloudy, sometimes clear, and from the mutable air borrows light. It giveth strength and vigor in his kind, and fair, sweet, quiet sleep brings to the mind. Rabiates being clearly colored, born about one doth make him eloquent, and in great honor to be favored. If he do use it to a good intent, foul venomous serpents it doth bring in awe and cureth pain and grief about the moor, the iron-drawing lodestone if you set, within a vessel, either gold or brass, and place a piece of iron under it, of some indifferent size or smallest compass, the lodestone on the top will cause it move, and by his virtue meet with it above, the mead stone colored like the grassy gree, much gentle ease unto the gout hath done, and helpeth those being troubled with the spleen, mingled with woman's milk bearing a son, it remedieth the wit-assailing frenzy, and purgeth the sad mind of melancholy, the stone or right spotted o'er with white, being worn, or hung about a woman's neck, prohibiteth conception and delight, and the child-bearing womb by force doth check, or else it hasteneth her deliver, and makes the birth unperfect and untimely. Sky-colored sapphire kings and princes wear, being held most precious in their judging sight, the very touch of this doth thoroughly cure the carbuncles in raging hateful spite. It doth delight and recreate the eyes, and all base grossness it doth quite despise. If in a box you put an envenomed spider, whose poisonous operation is annoying, and on the box's top lay the true sapphire, the virtue of his power shows us his cunning. He vanquisheth the spider, leaves him dead, and to Apollo now is consecrated. The fresh green-colored smarag doth excel, all trees, boughs, plant, and new fresh springing leaves. The hot reflecting sun can never quell, his virtue that no eyesight e'er deceives. But o'er fair Phoebus glory it triumpheth, and the dime dusky eyes it polisheth. The valiant Caesar took his chief delight by looking on the sigma mu alpha whom he cronu excellent to see his Romain soldiers how they fight, and view what wards they had for their defense, and who excelled in perfect chivalry, and noblest bore himself in victory. This stone doth serve to divination, to tell of things to come, and things being past, and amongst us held in estimation, giving the sick man's meat a gentle taste. If things shall be, it keeps in the mind. If not, forgetfulness our eyes doth blind. The turch is being wome in a ring, if any gentleman have cause to ride, support, and doth sustain him from all falling, or hurting of himself whate'er betide, and ere he suffer any fearful danger, will fall itself, and break, and burst asunder. Phoenix, these wondrous things of nature to men's ears, 
will almost prove sweet nature incredible, but by time's ancient record it appears, these hidden secrets to be memorable. For his divine eyes that hath wrought this wonder rules men and beasts, the lightning and the thunder, nature, for the world's blindness and opinion. I care not, Phoenix, they are misbelieving, and if their eyes try not conclusion, they will not trust a stranger's true reporting. With beasts and birds I will conclude my story, and to that all in all yield perfect glory. In yonder woody grove and fertile plain remains the leopard and the watery badger. The bugle or wild ox doth there remain, the onus and tor and the cruel tiger, the dromedary and the princely lion, the boar, the elephant, and the poisonous dragger, the strong-necked bull that never felt the yoke, the cat, the dog, the wolf, and cruel viper, the lurking hare that pretty sport provokes, the goat buck, hedgehog, and the swift-foot panther, the horse, camelopard, and strong-pawed bear, the ape, the assay, and the most fearful deer, the mouse, the mule, the sow, and salamander, that from the burning fire cannot live, the weezer, camel, and the hunted beaver, that in pursuit away his stones doth give, the stellia, chameleon, and unicorn, that doth expel hot poison with his horn, the cruel bear in her conception, brings forth at first a thing that's indigest, a lump of flesh without all fashion, which she by often licking brings to rest, making a formal body good and found, which often in this eland we have found, hic format lingua fetum, quem pretulit ursa, the great wild boar of nature terrible, with two strong tushes for his armory, sometimes assails the bear most horrible, and twixt them is a fight both fierce and deadly, he hunteth after mariorum and organy, which as a whetstone doth his need supply. The bugle or wild ox is never tamed, but with an iron ring put through his snout, that of some perfect strength must needs be framed. Then may you lead him all the world about. The huntsmen find him hung within a tree, fast by the horns and then thy use no pity. The camel is of nature flexible, for when a burden on his back is bound, to ease the laborer he is known most gentle, for why he kneeleth down upon the ground, suffering the man to put it off, or art, as it seems best in his discretion, they live some fifty or some hundred years, and can remain from water full four days, and most delight to drink when there appears. A muddy spring that's troubled many ways, between them is a natural honest care. If one conjoineth with his dame, tis rare. The dragon is a poisonous venomed beast, with whom the elephant is at enmity, and in contention they do never rest, till one hath slain the other cruelly. The dragon with the elephant tries a fall, and being under he is slain withal, the bunch-backed, big-boned, swift-foot dromedary, of Dromas the Greek word borrowing the name, for his quick-flying, speedy property, which easily these countrymen do tame. He'll go a hundredth miles within one day, and never seek in any place to stay. The dog a natural, kind, and loving thing, as witnesseth our histories of old. Their master dead, the poor fool with lamenting, doth kill himself before accounted bold, and would defend his master if he might, when cruelly his foe begins to fight. The elephant with tushes ivory is a great friend to man as he doth travel, the dragon hating man most spitefully. The elephant doth with the dragon quarrel, and twixt them two is a most deadly strife, till that the man be past and saved his life, the elephant seen in astronomy, will every month play the physician, taking delight his cunning for to try, giving himself a sweet purgation, and to the running springs himself address, and in the same wash off his filthiness. The goat de buck is a beast lascivious, and given much to filthy vinery, apt and prone to be contentious, seeking by craft to kill his enemy, his blood being warm suppleth the adamant, that neither fire or force could ever dawn. The hedgehog hath a sharp, quick-thorned garment, that on his back doth serve him for defence. He can presage the winds incontinent, and hath good knowledge in the difference between the southern and the northern wind. These virtues are allotted him by kind, 
whereon in Constantinople that great sit, a merchant in his garden gave one nourishment, by which he knew the wind's true certainty, because the hedgehogs gave him just presagement, apples or pear or grapes, such as his meat, which on his back he carries for to eat, the spotted lynx in face much like a lion, his urine is of such a quality, in time it turneth to a precious stone, called Ligarius for his property, he hateth man so much that he doth hide, his urine in the earth, not to be spied, the princely lion king of forest kings, and chief commander of the wilderness, at whose fair feet all beasts lay down their offering, yielding allegiance to his worthiness, his strength remaineth most within his head, his virtue in his heart is compassed, he never wrongs a man, nor hurts his prey. If they will yield submissive at his feet, he knoweth when the lionesses plays false play. If in all kindness he his love do meet, he doth defend the poor and innocent, and those that cruel-hearted beasts have rent, then is it not pity that the crafty fox, the ravenous wolf, the tiger, and the bear, the slow past dull brain's heavy ox, should strive so good a state to overwear, the lion sleeps and laughs to see them strive, but in the end leaves not a beast alive. The honor centaur is a monstrous beast. Suppose it half a man and half an ass, that never shuts his eyes in quiet rest, till he his foe's dear life hath round in compass. Such were the centaurs in their tyranny, that lived by humane flesh and villainy. The stelio is a beast that takes his breath, and liveth by the dew that's heavenly taking his food and spirit of the earth, and so maintains his life in chastity. He takes delight to counterfeit all colors, and yet for all this he is venomous. Phoenix, tis strange to hear such perfect difference in all things that his mightiness hath framed. Tis strange to hear their manner of defense amongst all creatures that my nurse hath named. Are there no worms nor serpents to be found? In this sweet-smelling owl, and fruitful ground. Nature, within a little corner towards the east, a moorish plot of earth and dampish place, some creeping worms and serpents used to rest, and in a manner doth this bad ground grace. It is unpeopled and unhabited, for there with poisonous air they are fed. Here lives the whir, the gnat and grasshopper, rhinotrix, lizard, and the fruitful bee, the moth, chelydras, and the bloodsucker, that from the flesh sucks blood most speedily. Serastus, Aspis, and the crocodile, that doth the wayfaring passenger beguile. The laboring ant, and the bespeckled adder, the frog, the toad, and summer haunting fly, the pretty silkworm, and the poisonous viper, that with his teeth doth wound most cruelly. The hornet, and the poisonous cockatrice, that kills all birds by a most sly device. The aspis is a kind of deadly snake. He hurts most perilous with venomed sting, and in pursuit doth near his foe forsake, but slays a man with poisonous venomy. Between the male and female is such love, as is betwixt the most kind turtle dove. This is the snake that Cleopatra used, the Egyptian queen beloved of Anthony. That with her breasts dear blood was nourished, making her die, fair soul, most patiently, rather than Caesar's great victorious hand should triumph o'er the queen of such a land. The lizard is a kind of loving creature, especially to man he is a friend. This property is given him by nature, from dangerous beasts poor man he doth defend, for being sleepy he all sense forsaketh, the lizard bites him till the man awaketh. The ant or emote is a laboring thing, and have amongst them all a public wheel. In summer time their meat they are providing, and secrets amongst themselves they do conceal. The monstrous huge big beer being sickly, eating of these is cured presently. The fruitful pretty bee lives in the hive, which unto him is like a peopled sit, and by their daily labor there they thrive, bringing home honeyed wax continually. They are reputed civil, and have kings, and guides for to direct them in proceedings, when that their emperor or king is present, they live in peaceful sort and quietness. But if their officer or king be absent, they fly and swarm abroad in companies. If any happen casual wise to die, 
They mourn and bury him right solemnly. The crocodile a saffron-colored snake, sometimes upon the earth is conversant, and other times lives in a filthy lake, being oppressed with foul needy one. The skin upon his back as hard as stone, resisteth violent strokes of steel or iron. Renatrix is a poisonous envenomed serpent that doth infect the rivers and the fountains, bringing to cattle hurt and detriment. When thirsty they forsake the steepy mountains, Renatrix violates her aquae and infects the earth. With his most noisome, stinking, filthy breath, the scorpion hath a deadly stinging tail, bewitching some with his fair, smiling face, but presently with force he doth assail his captived prey and brings him to disgrace, wherefore tis called of some the flattering were, that subtilly his foe doth overturn, Orion made his boast the earth should bring, or yield no serpent forth but he would kill it, where presently the scorpion up did spring, for so the only powers above did will it, where in the people's presence they did see, Orion stung to death most cruelly, of worms are divers sorts and divers names, some feeding on hard timber, some on trees, some in the earth a secret cabin frame, some live on tops of ashes, some on olives, some of a red waterish color, some of green, and some within the night like fire are seen, the silkworm by whose web our silks are made. For she doth daily labor with her weaving, a worm that's rich and precious in her trade, that whilst poor soul she toileth in her spinning, leaves nothing in her belly but empty air, and toiling too much falleth to despair. Here lives the caddies and the long-legged crane, with whom the pygmies are at mortal strife. The lark and lapwing that with nets are tame, and so poor silly souls do end their life, the nightingale wronged by adultery, the night crow, goshawk, and the chattering pie, the pheasant, stork, and the high-towering falcon, the swan that in the river takes delight, the goldfinch, blackbird, and the big-necked heron the screeching owl that loves the dusky night, the partridge, griffin, and the lively peacock, the linnet, bullfinch, snipe, and ravening puttock, the robin redbreast that in winter sings, the pelican, the jay, and the chirping sparrow, the little wren that many young ones brings, hersin, ibis, and the swift-winged swallow, the princely eagle and caladrius, the cuckoo that to some is prosperous, the snow-like colored bird Caladrius, hath this inestimable natural prosperity, if any man in sickness, dangerous, hopes of his health to have recover. This bird will always look with cheerful glance, if otherwise, sad is his countenance, the crane directed by the leader's voice, flies o'er the seas to countries far unknown, and in the secret night they do rejoice to make a watch among them of their own. The watchman in his claws holds fast a stone, which letting fall the rest are wake to know. The spring-delighting bird we call the cuckoo, which comes to tell of wonders in this age, her pretty one note to the world doth show. Some men their destiny and doth presage, the woman's pleasure and the man's disgrace, which she sits singing in a secret place. The winter's envious blast she never tasteth, yet in all countries doth the cuckoo sing and oftentimes to peopled towns she hasteth, therefore to tell the pleasures of the spring. Great courtiers hear her voice, but let her fly, knowing that she presageth destiny. This pretty bird sometimes upon the steeple sings cuckoo, cuckoo, to the parish priest. Sometimes again she flies amongst the people, and on their cross no man can her resist. But there she sings, yet some disdaining dames do charm her horse, lest she should hit their names, she scorns to labor or make up a nest, but creeps by stealth into some other's room, and with the lark's dear young, her young ones rest, being by subtile dealing overcome. The young birds are restorative to eat, and held amongst us as a prince's meat. The princely eagle of all birds the king, for none but she can gaze against the sun. Her eyesight is so clear that in her flying, she spies the smallest beast that ever run, as swift as gunshot using no delay. So swiftly doth she fly to catch her prey. She brings her birds being young into the air, 
and sets them for to look on Phoebus' light, but if their eyes with gazing chance to water, those she accounteth bastards, leaves them quite, but those that have true perfect constant eyes, she cherisheth, the rest she doth despise. The griffon is a bird rich feathered, his head is like a lion, and his flight is like the eagle's, much for to be feared, for why he kills men in the ugly night. Some say he keeps the smaragd and the jasper, and in pursuit of man is monstrous eager, the gentle birds called the fair hersony, taking the name of that place where they breed, within the night they shine so gloriously, that man's astonied senses they do feed, for in the dark being cast within the way, gives light unto the man that goes astray. Ebus the bird flieth to Nilus flood, and drinking of the water purgeth clean, unto the land of Egypt he doth good. For he to rid their serpents is a mean, he feedeth on their eggs, and doth destroy the serpents' nests that would their climb annoy. The lapwing hath a piteous mournful cry, and sings a sorrowful and heavy song, but yet she's full of craft and subtlety, and weepeth most being farthest from her young. In elder age she served for soothsayers, and was a prophetess to the augurer, the birds of Egypt or Memnodes, of Memnon that was slain in rescuing Troy, are said to file away in companies, to Priam's palace, and there twice a day. They fight about the turrets of the dead, and the third day in battle are confounded. The nightingale, the night's true chorister, music's chief lover in the pleasant spring, Tunes hunts up to the sun that doth delight her, and to Arion's harp aloud will sing, and as a bridegroom that to church is coming, so he salutes the sun when he is rising. The Romain Caesars, happy emperors, especially those of the youngest sort, have kept the nightingale within their towers, to play to Dal and to make them sport. And oftentimes in Greek and Latin tongue, they taught those birds to sing a pleasant song, this bird, as histories make mention, sung in the infant mouth of Stesichorus, which did foretell due commendation, in all his actions to be prosperous. So bees, when Plato in his bed did lie, swarmed round about his mouth, leaving their honey, the sluggish slothful and the dastard owl, hating the day and loving of the night, about old sepulchres doth daily howl, frequenting barns and houses without light and hides him often in an ivy tree, least with small chattering birds wronged he should be, for dark sic volucris venturi nuntia luctus, ignanus bubo, durum mortalibus omen, the filthy messenger of ill to come, the sluggish owl is, and to danger some, this ill-be-dooming owl sate on the spear, of warlike Pyrrhus marching to the field, when to the Gracian army he drew near, determining to make his foes to yield, which did foreshow sinister happiness and baleful fortune in his business, the parrot called the counterfeiting bird, decked with all colors that fair flora yields, that after one will speak you word for word, living in woody groves near fertile field, they have been known to give great emperors wine, and therefore some men hold them for divine, the proud sun-braving peacock with his feathers, walks all along, thinking himself a king, and with his voice prognosticates all weathers, although God knows but badly he doth sing, but when he looks down to his base black feet, he drops and is ashamed of things unmeet. The mighty Macedonian Alexander, marching in lovely triumph to his foes, being accounted the world's conqueror, in Indy spies a peacock as he goes, and marveling to see so rich a sight, charged all men not to kill his sweet delight. The pelican, the wonder of our age, as Erome saith, revives her tender young, and with her purest blood she doth assuage. Her young ones thirst, with poisonous adder strong, and those that were supposed three days dead, she gives them life once more being nourished. The unsatiate sparrow doth prognosticate, and is held good for divination, for flying here and there, from gate to gate, foretells true things by animadversion. A flight of sparrows flying in the day did prophesy the fall and sack of Troy, the artificial nest-composing swallow that eats his meat flying along the way. 
whose swiftness in our eyesight doth allow that no imperial bird makes her his prey. His young ones being hurt within the eye, his helps them with the herb Chalcedonies, Sassina, and the great Philateron, being Pompey's warlike and approved knight, sent letters by these birds without a man to many of their friends and chief delights, and all their letters to their feet did tie, which with great speed did bring them hastily. The sweet recording swan Apollo's joy, and fiery scorched Phaeton's delight, in footed verse sings out his deep annoy, and to the silver rivers takes his flight, prognosticates to sailors on the seas, fortune's prosperity and perfect ease, Cygnus in auspicies sempelatissimus ales, hoc optant norte, quia sinon mergit in undis, phoenix. But what sad mournful drooping soul is this, within whose watery eyes sits discontent, whose snail-paced gait tells something is amiss, from whom is banished sporting merriment, whose feathers mowed off, falling as he goes, the perfect picture of heart-pining woes. Nature, this is the careful bird the turtle dove, whose heavy crooking note doth show his grief, and thus he wanders seeking of his love, refusing all things that may yield relief. All motions of good turns, all mirth and joy, are bad, fled, gone, and fallen into decay. Phoenix, is this the true example of the heart? Is this the tutor of fair constancy? Is this love's treasure and love's pining smart? Is this the substance of all honesty? And comes he thus attired, alas, poor soul, that destiny's soul wrath should thee control? See, Norse, he stares and looks me in the face, and now he mourns worse than he did before. He hath forgot his dull, slow, heavy pace, but with swift gait he eyes us more and more. Oh, shall I welcome him, and let me borrow some of his grief to mingle with my sorrow? Nature. Farewell, fair bird, I'll leave you both alone. This is the dove you long so much to see, and this will prove companion of your mind, an umpire of all true humility. Then note my phoenix, what there may ensue. And so I kiss my bird. Adieu, adieu. Phoenix, mother farewell, and now within his eyes. Sit sorrow clothed in a sea of tears, and more and more the billows do awry. Pale grief half pined upon his brow appears. His feathers fade away and make him look, as if his name were writ in death's pale book. Turtle, oh stay, poor turtle, whereat hast thou gazed? At the eye-dazzling sun, whose sweet reflection, the round encompass heavenly world amazed. Oh no, a child of nature's true complexion, the perfect phoenix of rarity, for wit, for virtue, and excelling beauty. Phoenix, hail map of sorrow turtle, welcome Cupid's child, let me wipe off those tears upon thy cheeks, that stain thy beauty's pride, and have defiled nature itself, that so usurping seeks, to sit upon thy face, for I'll be partner, of thy heart's rap sorrow more hereafter. Turtle, nature's fair darling, let me kneel to thee, and offer up my true obedience, and sacredly in all humility, crave pardon for presumption's sole offence. Thy lawn snow-colored hand shall not come near, my impure face to wipe away one tear. My tears are for my turtle that is dead, my sorrow springs from her want that is gone. My heavy note sounds for the soul that's fled, and I will die for him left all alone. I am not living, though I seem to go, already buried in the grave of woe. Phoenix, why I have left Arabia for thy sake, because those fires have no working substance, and for to find thee out did undertake, where on the mountain top we may advance. Our fiery altar, let me tell thee this, Solomon miseris socios habuies dolore. Come, poor lamenting soul, come sit by me, we are all one, thy sorrow shall be mine. For thou a tear, and thou shalt plainly see. Mine eyes shall answer tear for tear of thine. Sigh thou, I'll sigh, and if thou give a groan, I shall be dead in answering of thy mind. Turtle, love's honorable friend, one groan of yours, will rend my sick love pining heart asunder. One sigh brings tears from me like April showers. Procured by summer's hot loud cracking thunder, be you as merry as sweet mirth may be. 
I'll groan and sigh both for yourself and me. Phoenix, thou shalt not gentle turtle, I will bear. Half of the burden us yoke thou dost sustain. Two bodies may with greater ease outwear. A troublesome labor, then I'll broke some pain. But tell me, gentle turt, tell me truly. The difference betwixt false love and true sincerity. Turtle, that shall I briefly, if you'll give me leave. False love is full of envy and deceit. With cunning shifts our humors to deceive, laying down poison for a surged bait. Always inconstant, false, and variable, delighting in fond change and mutable. True love is loving pure, not to be broken, but with an honest eye she eyes her lover. Not changing variable, nor never shoken, with fond suspicion, secrets to discover. True love will tell no lies, nor never dissemble, but with a bashful modest fear will tremble. False, love puts on a mask to shade her folly. True love goes naked wishing to be seen. False love will counterfeit perpetually. True love is Troth's sweet empyrean queen. This is the difference. True love is a jewel. False love, heart's tyrant, inhumane and cruel. Phoenix, what may we wonder at? Oh, where is learning? Where is all difference twixt the good and bad? Where is a Pelizard? Where is true cunning? Nay, where is all the virtue may be had? Within my turtle's bosom, she refines, more than some loving perfect true divines, thou shalt not be no more the turtle dove. Thou shalt no more go weeping all alone, for thou shalt be myself, my perfect love. Thy grief is mine, thy sorrow is my mine. Come kiss me, sweet is sweet, oh, I do bless it. This gracious lucky sunshine happiness, turtle. How may I in all gratefulness requite? This gracious favor offered to thy servant, the time affordeth heaviness, not delight. And to the time's appoint we'll be observant. Command, O oh, do command, whate'er thou wilt. My heart's blood for thy sake shall straight be spilt. Phoenix, then I command thee on thy tender care and chief obedience that thou owest to me, that thou especially, dear bird, beware of impure thoughts or unclean chastity, for we must was together in that fire, that will not burn but by true love's desire, turtle, a spot of that foul monster near did stain. These drooping feathers, nor I never knew, in what base filthy climate doth remain, that sprite incarnate and to tell you true, I am as spotless as the purest white, clear without stay, of envy, or despite, phoenix. Then to you next adjoining grove we'll fly, and gather sweet wood for to make our flame, and in a manner sacrificingly burn both our bodies to revive one name, and in all humbleness we will entreat the hot earth parching sun to lend his heat. Turtle, why now my heart is light, this very dome hath banished sorrow from my pensive breast, and in my bosom there is left no room to set black melancholy or let him rest. I'll fetch sweet myrrh to burn, and licorice, sweet juniper, and straw them o'er with spice. Phoenix, pile up the wood, and let us invocate his great name that doth ride within his chariot, and guides the day's bright eye. Let's nominate some of his blessings that he well may wot. Our faithful service and humility offered unto his highest deity, great God Apollo, for the tender love thou once didst bear to willful Phaeton that did desire thy chariot's rule above, which thou didst grieve in heart to think upon. Send thy hot kindling light into this wood, that shall receive the sacrifice of blood, turtle, for thy sweet Daphne's sake thy best beloved, and for the harp received of Mercury, and for the muses of thee favoured, whose gift of wit excels all excellency. Send thy hot kindling fire into this wood, that shall receive the sacrifice of blood, Phoenix, for thy sweet father's sake, great Jupiter, that with his thunderbolts commands the earth, and for Latona's sake, thy gentle mother, that first gave Phoebus glory's lively breath. Send thy hot kindling light into this wood, that shall receive the sacrifice of blood. Stay, stay, poor turtle. Oh, we are betrayed. Behind you, little bush, there sits a spy, 
that makes me blush with anger, half afraid, that in our motions secretly would pry. I will go chide with him, and drive him thence, and plague him for presumption's foul offence. Turtle, be not afraid, it is the pelica. Look how her young ones make her breast to bleed, and draws the blood forth, do the best she can, and with the same their hungry fancies feed. Let her alone to view our tragedy, and then report our love that she did see. See, beauteous phoenix, it begins to burn. O oh, blessed Phoebus, happy, happy light. Now will I recompense thy great good turn, and first, dear bird, I'll vanish in thy sight, and thou shalt see with what a quick desire I'll leap into the middle of the fire. Phoenix, stay, turtle, stay, for I will first prepare. Of my bones must the princely phoenix rise, and if be possible thy blood we'll spare, for none but for my sake dost thou despise this frailty of thy life, O oh, live thou still, and teach the base deceitful world love's will. Turtle, have I come hither drooping through the woods, and left the springing groves to seek for thee? Have I forsook to bath me in the floods, and pined away in careful misery? Do not deny me, Phoenix, I must be, a partner in this happy tragedy. Phoenix, O oh, holy, sacred, and pure, perfect fire, more pure than that ore which fair Dido moans, more sacred in my loving kind desire, than that which burnt old Eason's aged bones. Except into your ever-hallowed flame, two bodies from the which may spring one name. Turtle, O oh sweet perfumed flame, made of those tree, under the which the muses nine have saw, the praise of virtuous maids in mysteries, to whom the fair-faced nymphs did often throng. Accept my body as a sacrifice, into your flame, of whom one name may rise, Phoenix. O oh, willfulness, see how with smiling cheer, my poor dear heart hath flung himself to thrall. Look what a mirthful countenance he doth bear, spreading his wings abroad, and joys withal. Learn thou corrupted world, learn, hear, and see, friendship's unspotted true sincerity. I come, sweet turtle, and with my bright wings, I will embrace thy burnt bones as they lie. I hope of these another creature spring, that shall possess both our authority. I stay to long, oh, take me to your glory, and thus I end the turtle dove's true story. Phoenix, ah, see, pelican, what wondrous heart-grieving spectacle! Hast thou beheld the world's true miracle? With what a spirit did the turtle fly into the fire? and cheerfully did die. He looked more pleasant in his countenance, within the flame than when he did advance, his pleasant wings upon the natural ground. True perfect love had so his poor heart bound, the phoenix nature's dear adopted child, with a pale heavy countenance, wan and mild, grieved for to see him first possess the place, that was allotted her, herself to graze, and follows cheerfully her second turn and both together in that fire do burn. Ah, if the rarest creatures of the earth, because but one at once did e'er take breath, within the world should with a second he, a perfect form of love and amity, burn both together, what should there arise? And be presented to our mortal eyes, out of the fire, but a more perfect creature, because that two in one is put by nature, the one hath given the child enchanting beauty, the other gives it love and chastity, the one hath given it wits rare it, the other guides the wit most charily, the one for virtue doth excel the rest, the other in true constancy is blessed. If that the phoenix had been separated, and from the gentle turtle had been parted, love had been murdered in the infancy, without these two no love at all can be. Let the love wandering wits but learn of these, to die together, so their grief to ease. But lovers nowadays do love to change, and here and there their wanton eyes do range. Not pleased with one choice, but seeking many, and in the end scarce is content with any. Love nowadays is like a shadowed sight that shows itself in Phoebus' golden light. But if in kindness you do strive to take it, fades clean away, and you must needs forsake it. Lovers are like the leaves with winter shoken, brittle like glass that with one fall is broken, O fond corrupted age, when birds shall show.
the world their duty, and to let men know that no sinister chance should hinder love. Though as these two did, death's arrest they prove, I can but mourn with sadness and with grief, not able for to yield the world relief, to see these two consumed in the fire, whom love did copulate with true desire, but in the world's wide ear I mean to ring, the same of this day's wondrous offering, that they may sing in notes of chastity. The turtle and the phoenix amid. Conclusion. Gentle conceivers of true meaning wit. Let good experience judge what I have writ, for the satirical fond applauded veins, whose bitter wormwood spirit in some strains bite like the cures of Egypt those that love them. Let me alone, I will be loth to move them. For why, when mighty men their wit do prove? How shall I least of all expect their love? Yet to those men I gratulate some pain, because they touch those that in art do feign, but those that have the spirit to do good, their whips will will never draw one drop of blood. To all and all in all that view my labor, of every judging sight I crave some favor, at least to read, and if you reading fine, a lame-legged staff, tis lameness of the mind. That had no better skill, yet let it pass, for burnous loads are set upon an ass, from the sweet fire of perfumed wood. Another princely phoenix upright stood, whose feathers purified did yield more light than her late burned mother out of sight. And in her heart rests a perpetual love, sprung from the bosom of the turtle dove. Long may the new uprising bird increase, some humors and some motions to release, and thus to all I offer my devotion hoping that gentle minds accept my motion. Phoenix. Ah, see Cantus alphabet-wise to fair Phoenix made by the Paphian dove. Eh, one. A hill, a hill, a Phoenix seeks a hill, a promontory top, a stately mountain, a river, where poor soul she dips her bill, and that sweet silver stream is nature's fountain, accomplishing all pleasures at her will. Ah, be my Phoenix, I will be thy dove and thou and I in secrecy will love. Be too, blaze not my love, thou herald of the day. Bless not the mountain tops with my sweet shine. Beloved more I am than thou canst say. Blessed and blessed be that saint of my balm, honey sweet, and honor of this clime. Blotted by things unseen, beloved of many. But love's true motion dares not give to it. See three, chasteness farewell, farewell the bed of glory. Constrained to do, thou art love's enemy. Come true report, make of my love a story. Cast lots for my poor heart, so thou enjoy me. Come, come, sweet phoenix, I at length do claim thee. Chaste bird, too chaste, to hinder what is willing. Come in mine arms, and we'll not sit a-billing. Deep bore, devout obedience on my knees I prefer. Delight matched with delight, if thou do crave it. Deny not, gentle phoenix, my sweet offer. Despair not in my love, for thou shalt have it. Damn not the soul to woe, if thou canst save it. Doves pray devoutly, oh, let me request. Delicious love to build within thy nest. Eat five, envy is banished, do not thou despair. Evil motions tempt thee sooner than the good. Enrich thy beauty that art famed for fair. Everything silent to conjoin thy blood. Esteem the thing that cannot be withstood. Esteem of me, and I will lend thee fire, even of mine own to fit thy sweet desire. F. 6. Faint-hearted soul, why dost thou dye thy cheeks, fearful of that which will revive thy sense? Faith and obedience thy sweet mercy seeks. Friends plighted war with thee I will commence. Fear not at all, tis but sweet love's offence, fit to be done, so doing tis not seen, fetched from the ancient records of a queen. G. Sever, gold beautifying phoenix, I must praise thee. Grant gracious heavens a delightsome muse. Give me old Homer's spirit, and I'll raise thee. Gracious in thought, do not my love refuse. Great map of beauty, make thou no excuse. Gainst my true loving spirit, do not carp. Grant me to play my sonnet on thy harp. H. 8. Health to thy virtues, health to all thy beauty. Honor attend thy steps when thou art going. High heavens force the birds to owe thee duty. Heart-groaning care to thee still stands a-wooing. 
Have pity on him, Phoenix, for so doing. Help his disease and cure his malady. Hide not thy secret glory, least he die. Ah, nine, I love, oh, love how thou abuses me. I see the fire and warm me with the flame. I note the errors of thy deity. Invest us honor, Venus lusts to tame. I in my humors yield thee not a name. I count thee foolish, fie, adulterous boy. I touch the sweet, but cannot taste the joy. K-10, kisses are true love's pledges, kiss thy dear turtle. Keep not from him the secrets of thy youth. Knowledge he'll teach thee under a green spread myrtle. Ken shalt thou be of no map of my truth. Know first the motion, when the life ensueth. Knock at my heart's door, I will be thy porter. So thou wilt let me enter in thy daughter. L. 11. Love is my great aduotrix. At thy shrine, love pleads for me, and from my tongue doth say, Lie where thou wilt, my heart shall sleep with thine. Lamenting of thy beauty fresh as may, Look, Phoenix, to thyself do not decay. Let me but water thy dead sapless flower. Love gives me hope twill flourish in an hour. Ed. 12. Make not a jewel of nice chastity, muster and summon all thy wits in one. My heart to thee swears perfect constancy. Motions of zeal are to be thought upon. Mark how thy time is overspent and gone, misled by folly and a kind of fear. Mark and not thy beauty, so my dearest dear. N13. Note but the fresh bloomed rose within her pride. No rose to be compared unto thee. Nothing so soon unto the ground will slide not being gathered in her chiefest beauty. Neglecting time, it dies with infamy. Never be o'er, lest whilst thy leaves are spread, none gather thee, and then thy grace is dead. O, oh, fourteen, O, oh, look upon me, and within my brow, officious motions of my heart appears, opening the book of love, wherein I vow, over thy shrine to shed continual tears. O, oh, no, I see my phoenix hath no ears, or if she have ears, yet no eyes to see. O oh, all disgraced with continual folly. P. 15. Proud chastit, why dost thou seek to roar? Phoenix, my love, with lessons too precise, pray thou for me, and I will make a song. Pend in thine honor, none shall equalize. Possess not her, whose beauty charms mine eyes. Plead, sue, and seek, or I will banish thee. Her body is my castle and my fee. Key 16. Question not, Phoenix, why I do adore thee, quite captivate and prisoner at thy core. Quit me with love again, do not abhor me, quell down with hope as subjugate to thrall. Quailed will I never be despite of all, quaking I stand before thee, still expecting. Thine own consent, our joys to be affecting. Ah, 17. Remember how thy beauty is abused. React on the tenterhooks of foul disgrace. Rivers are dry, and must be needs refused. Restore new water in that dead fount's place. Refresh thy feathers, beautify thy face. Read on my book, and there thou shalt behold. Rich loving letters printed in fine gold. S. 18. Shame is a shame to see the obstinate, smiling at thy womanish concept, swearing that honor never thee begat. Sucking in poison for a surged bait, singing thy pride of beauty in her height. Sit by my side, and I will sing to thee sweet ditties of a new framed harmony. T-19, t thou art a turtle wanting of thy mate. Thou crookest about the groves to find thy lover. Thou fliest to woods, and fertile plains dost hate. Thou in oblivion dost true virtue smother. To thy sweet self thou canst not find another. Turn up my bosom, and in my pure heart thou shalt behold the turtle of thy smart. V. 20. Upon a day I sought to scale a fort, united with a tower of sure defense. Uncomfortable trees did mart my sport, unlucky fortune with my woe's expense. Venus with Mars would not sweet war commence. Upon an altar would I offer love and sacrifice my soul, poor turtle dove. Dub weep not, my phoenix, though I daily weep. Woe is the herald that declares my tale. Worthy thou art in Venus lap to sleep, wantonly covered with God Cupid's veil, with which he doth all mortal sense exhale.
wash not thy cheeks, unless I sit by thee, to dry them with my sighs immediately. Tenth twenty-two. Xantha fair nymph resemble not in nature. Xantheep love to patience Socrates. Xantha my love is a more milder creature, and of a nature better for to please. Xantheep thought her true love to disease, but my rare phoenix is at last well pleased, to cure my passions, passions seldom eased. Why? Twenty-three. If thou have pity, pity my complaining, it is a badge of virtue in thy sex. If thou do kill me with thy coy disdaining, it will at length thy self-will anguish vex, and with continual sighs thyself perplex. I'll help to bring thee wood to make thy fire, if thou wilt give me kisses for my hire. Say twenty-four. Zenobia, at thy feet I bend my knee, for thou art queen and empress of my heart. All blessed happen true felicit, all pleasures that the wide world may impart. Befall thee for thy gracious good desert. Accept my meaning as it fits my turn. For I with thee to ashes mean to burn. Cantos verbally written. 1. Pity me that dies for thee. Pity my plainings, thou true nurse of pit. Me hath thy piercing looks enjoyed to sighing. That cannot be redressed for thy beauty. Dies my sad heart, sad heart that's drowned with weeping. For what so here I think, or what I do. Thee with mine eyes, my thoughts, my heart, I woe. Two, my life you save, if you I have. My eyes, my hand, my heart seek to maintain. Life for thy love, therefore be gracious. You with your kindness have my true heart slain. Save my poor life, and be not tyrannous. If any grace do in thy breast remain, you women have been counted amorous. I pine in sadness, all proceeds from thee. Have me in liking through thy clemency. Three, do thou by me as I by thee. Do not exchange thy love, lest in exchanging thou bear the burnous blot of foul disgrace. By that bad fault are many faults containing. Me still assuring nothing is so base as in the world's eye always to be ranging. I swear, sweet phoenix, in this holy case, by all the sacred relics of true love, Thee to adore whom I still constant prove. For, vouchsafe to think how I do pine, In loving thee that art not mine, Vouchsafe, with splendor of thy gracious look, To grace my passions, passions still increasing. Think with thyself how I thy absence brook, How day by day my plaints are never ceasing, I have for thee all companies forsook. Do thou rejoice, and in rejoicing say, Pine near so much, I'll take thy grief away. In that great gracing word shalt thou be counted, loving to him that is thy true sworn lover. Thee on the stage of honor have I mounted, that no base misty cloud shall ever cover. Art thou not fair? Thy beauty do not smother, not in thy flowering youth, but still suppose. Mine own to be, my never dying rose. Five, my destiny to thee is known. Cure thou my smart, I am thine own. My time in love's biddableness is spent. Destiny and fates do will it so. To Circe's charming tongue mine ear I lent. Thee, loving that dost wish my overthrow. Is not this world wrapped in inconstancy, known to most men as hell's misery? Cure of my wound is past all physic's skill. Thou mayst be gracious at thy very look. My wounds will clothe. That would my body kill. Smart will be ease that could no plasters brook. I of my phoenix being quite forsook, am like a man that nothing can fulfill. Thine ever-piercing eye of force will make me. Own heart, own love, that never will forsake thee. Six. O'er my heart your eyes do idolatrize. O'er the wide world my lovelays I'll be sending. My lovelays in my love's praise always written. Heart comfortable motions still attending, your beauty and your virtuous zeal commending, eyes that no frost's cold rage hath ever bitten. Do you then think that I in love's hot fire idolatrize and surfeit in desire? Seven, I had rather love though in vain that face than have of any other grace. I being forced to carry Venus' shield had rather bear a phoenix for my crest rather than any bird within the field. Love tells me that her beauty is the best, 
Though some desire fair Vestus' turtle dove, In my bird's bosom resteth perfect love. Vain is that blind, unskillful heraldry, That will not cause my bird that is so rare. Face all the world for her rarity, Then who with her for honor may compare? Have we one like her for her pride of beauty? Of all the feathered queer in the air, Any but unto her do owe their duty. Other may blaze, but I will always say, Grace whom thou list, she bears the palm away. Eight. Whatever fall, I am at call. What thunderstorms of envy shall arrive? Ever to thee my heart is durable. Four fortunes wheel on me to tyrannize. I will be always found inexorable. Am I not then to thee most stable? At morn, midnight, and at midday sun. Call when thou wilt, my dear, to thee I'll run. Nine. I had rather love though in vain that face, then have of any other grace. I now do wish my love should be relieved. Had I my thoughts in compass of my will, rather than live and surfeit being grieved. Love in my breast doth wondrous things fulfill, though love's unkindness many men do kill. In her I trust, that is my true sworn lover. Vain he doth write that doth her virtues smother. That she is fair, nature herself alloweth, face full of beauty eyes resembling fire, then my pure heart to love thy heart still voweth. Have me in favor for my good desire, of holy love, love's temple to aspire. Any but thee my thoughts will near require. Other sweet motions now I will conceal. Grace these rude lines that my heart's thoughts reveal. 10. Disgrace not me, in loving thee. Disgrace be banished from thy heavenly brow not entertained of thy piercing eye. Me thy sweet lips, a sweet touch will allow. In thy fair bosom would I always lie, loving in such a down bed to be placed, thee for to please, myself for ever graced. Eleven, I had rather love though in vain that face, than have of any other grace. I live enriched with gifts of great content, had my desires the guerdon of good will. Rather than taste of fortune's fickle bent, Love bids me die, and scorn her witless skill. Though love command, despair doth still attend, In hazard proves oft times but doubtful end. Vain is the love encountered with denies, That yields but grief, where grace should rather grow. Face full of fury, void of courteous praise, Then since all love consists of weal and woe, Have still in mind that love deserves the best. Of hearts the touchstone, Inward motions loving, any that yields the fruit of true love's rest. Other I love unworthy of commending, graced with bare beauty, beauty most offending. Twelve, myself and mine are always thine. My care to have my blooming rose not wither, self-loving envy shall it not deny. And that base weed thy growth doth seek to hinder. Mine hands shall pull him up immediately, are they not envious monsters in thine eye? always with vain occasions to enclose thine ever-growing beauty like the rose. Thirteen, the darting of your eyes may heal or wound, let not empiring looks my heart confound. The eyeballs in your head are Cupid's fire, darting such hot sparkles at my breast. A force I am in thrall, and do desire your gracious love to make me happy blessed. Eyes, lip, and tongue have caused my unrest. May I unto the height of grace aspire. Heal my sick heart with love's great grief oppressed. Or if to fire thou wilt not yield such fuel, wound me to death, and so be counted cruel. Let the wide open mouthed world slander the guilty, not my dead phoenix that doth scorn such shame, empiring on a blot such infamy. Looks dart away the blemish of that name. My thoughts prognosticate thy lady's pity. Heart's ease to thee, this counsel will I give. Confound thy foes, but let true lovers live. Fourteen, you are my joy, be not so coy. You best beloved, you honor of delight, are the bright shining star that I adore. My eyes like watchmen gaze within the night. Joy fills my heart when you do shine before. Be not digressive to thy friend, therefore. Too glorious are thy looks to entertain. Coy thoughts, fell peevish deeds, our base disdain. 
15. For you I die, being absent from mine eye. For all the holy rites that Venus useth, you I conjure to true obedience, I offer faith, which no kind heart refuseth. Die perjured envy for thy late offence, being enamoured of rich beauty's pride. Absent, I freeze in winter's pining cold. From thee I sit, as if thou hadst denied, my lovesick passions twenty times retold. I, dazzling mistress, with a look of pity, grace my sad song and my heart's pining ditty. Sixteen, send me your heart to ease my smart, send but a glance of amours from thine eye. Me will it ravish with exceeding pleasure, your eyeballs do enwrap my destiny. Heart sick with sorrow, sorrow out of measure, to think upon my love's continual folly. Ease thou my pain from pity's golden treasure. My grief proceeds from thee, and I suppose, smart of my smart, will my life's blood enclose. Seventeen, seeing you have my, let me have thine. Seeing my passions are so penetrable, you of all others should be pitiful. Have mind of me, and you'll be favorable. Mine heart doth tell me you are merciful. Let my heart's love be always violable. Me have you found in all things dutiful. Have me in favor, and thyself shalt see. Thine and none others will I always be. 18. Within thy breast my heart doth rest, within the circuit of a crystal sphere. Thy eyes are plast, and underneath those eyes, breast of hard flint, ears that do scorn to hear. My day's sad groanings and night waking cries, heart sore sick passions and love's agonies, doth it become thy beauty? No, a stain rests on thy bright brow wrinkled with disdain. Nineteen, oh, let me hear from thee, my dear, O tongue, thou hast blasphemed thy holy goddess. Let me do penance for offending thee. Me do thou blame for my forgetfulness. Hear my submission, thou wilt succor me. From thy heart's closet cometh gentleness. Thee hath the world admired for clemency. My heart is sorrow, and I'll bite my tongue. Dear that to thee, to thee I offered wrong. Twenty. My phoenix rare is all my care. My life, my heart, my thought, I dedicate. Phoenix to thee, phoenix of all beauty. Rare things in heart of thee I meditate. Is it not time I come to show my duty? All favors unto thee I consecrate. My goods, my lands, myself, and all is thine. Care those that list, so thou fair bird be mine. Twenty-one, I would I might be thy delight. I wish for things, would they might take effect. Would they might end, and we enjoy our pleasure. I vow I would not proffer time neglect. Might I but gather such unlooked for treasure. Be all things envious, I would the respect. Thy favors in my heart I do enroll. Delight matched with delight doth me control. Twenty-two, if I you have, none else I crave, if adoration ever were created. I am a master of that holy art, you my adoer tricks, whom I have admired. Have of my true devotion bore a part, none but yourself may here be nominated. Else would my tongue my true obedience thwart, I cannot flatter, love will not allow it. Craw thou my heart, on thee. I will bestow it. Twenty-three. Be you to me, as I to thee. Be the poor bee. Suck honey from the flower. You have a spacious odoriferous field, to taste all moisture, wherein sweet flora's bower. Me shall you find submissively to yield, as a poor captive looking for the hower. I may have gracious looks, else am I kild, to die by you were life, and yet thy shame. Thee would the wide world hate, my folly blame. Twenty-four, you are the first in whom I trust. You, in your bosom, having placed a light. Ah, the chief admiral unto my fleet, the lanthorn for to guide me in the night, first to the shore, where I may set my feet, in safeguard, void of danger's cruel spite, whom in disgrace love and fell envy meet. I muster up my spirit, and they fly. Trust of thy faith controls mine enemy. Twenty-five, you are the last my love shall taste. You standing on the tower of hope and fear, a timorous of self-will foolishness, the only viper that doth love lays tear.
Loss can it not, tis woman's peevishness. My kind affections can it not forbear. Love tells me that tis bred in idleness. Shall such occasion hinder thee or me? Taste first the fruit, and then commend the tree. Twenty-six. If you I had, I should be glad. If the sun shine, the harvest man is glad. You are my son, my day's delightsome queen. I am your harvest labor almost mad. Had I not my glorious comet seen, I wish that I might sit within thy shade. Should I be welcome ere thy beauty fade, be not Narcissus, but be always kind. Glad to obtain the thing thou near couldst find. Twenty-seven. Though place be far, my heart is nigh. Though thou my dove from me be separated, place, nor the distance shall not hinder me. Be constant for a while, thou mayst be thwarted. Far am I not, I'll come to succor thee. My heart and thine, my sweet, shall never be parted. Heart made of love and true simplicity. Is not love lawless, full of powerful might? Nah to my heart that still with love doth fight. Twenty-eight. My thoughts are dead, cause thou art sped. My inward muse can sing of naught but love. Thoughts are his heralds, slaying to my breast. Are entertained, if they thence remove. Dead shall their master be, and in unrest. Cause all the world thy hatred to reprove. Thou art that all in all that I love best. Art thou then cruel? No, thou canst not be. Sped with so foul a fiend as cruelty. Twenty-nine, I send my heart to thee, where gladly I would be. I of all other am fair Venus thrall. Send me but pleasant glances of thine eye. My soul will leap with joy and dance with all. Heart of my heart and soul's felicity. To beauty's queen my heart is sanctified. Thee above all things have I deified. Where is affection? Fled to envy's cave. Gladly my thoughts would bear her company. I from foul bondage will my phoenix save. Would she in love requite my courtesy? Be loving as thou art fair, else shall I sing. Thy beauty a poisonous bitter thing. Thirty, if you me just have known. Then take me for your own. If you be fair, why should you be unkind? You have no perfect reason for the same. Methinks it were your glory for to find. Just measure at my hands, but you to blame. Have from the deepest closet of your heart known my pure thought, and yet I pine in smart. Then in the deepest measure of pure love, take pity on the sad, sick, pining soul. Me may you count your unknown turtle dove, for in my bosom's chamber I enroll. Your deep love darting eye, and still will be, own of your own, despite extremity. Thirty-one, my heart I send to be your friend, my dear soul's comfort, and my hope's true solace. Heart of my heart, and my life's secret joy, I in conceit do thy sweet self embrace. Send cloudy exhalations clean away to the blind misty north, therefore to stay. Be thou my arbor and my dwelling place, your arms the circling folds that shall enclose me. Friend me with this, and thou shalt never lose me. Thirty two. I have no love but you, my dove. I pine in sadness and in sad songs singing. Have spent my time, my ditties harsh and ill. No sight but thy fair sight would I be seeing. Love in my bosom keeps his castle still. But being dissevered, I sit always pining. You do procure me Niobe's cup to fill. My duty yet remembered I dare prove. Doves have no power for to exchange their love. Thirty-four. I will not change, though some be strange. I cannot stir one foot from Venus' gate. Will you come sit and bear me company? Not one, but you can make me fortunate. Change when thou wilt, it is but cruelty, though unto women it is given by fate. Some gentle minds these ranging thoughts do hate. Be thou of that mind, else I will conclude. Strange hast thou altered love, to be so rude. Thoughts keep me waking. Thoughts like the airy puffing of the wind keep a sweet feigning in my lovesick breast. Me still assuring that thou art most kind, waking in pleasure, sleeping sure in rest. That no sleeps dreaming, nor no waking cries, to our sweet loving thought, sweet rest denies, seeing that my heart made choice of thee, then frame thyself to comfort me.
Seeing love is pleased with love's enamored joys, that fortune cannot cross sweet Cupid's will. My love's content, not with fond wanton toys. Heart of my heart doth love's unkindness kill. Made by fond tongue's upbraiding hurtful skill, choose now is framed to further all annoys. Of all sweet thoughts, of all sweet happy rest, thee have I chose to make me three times blessed. Then let our holy true aspiring love frame us the sweetest music of desire. Thy words shall make true concord and remove self-will itself, for Venus doth require to be acquainted with thy beauty's fire. Comfort my heart, for comfort tells me this. Me hast thou chose of all to be thy bliss. My heart is bound to favor thee. Then yield in time to pity me. My phoenix hath two star-resembling eyes, heart full of pity, and her smiling look is of the sun's complexion, and replies, bound for performance by fair Venus book, to faithfulness, which from her nurse she took. Favor in her doth spring in virtuous praise, the eloquence itself shall seek to raise. Then in performance of this gracious right, yield up that piteous heart to be my lover. In recompense how I have loved thy sight, time shall from time to time to thee discover. To thee is given the power of Cupid's might, pity is writ in gold upon thy heart, me promising to cure a cureless smart. I joy to find a constant mine. I am encompassed round about with joy, joy to enjoy my sweet, for she protesteth, to comfort me that languish in annoy, find ease if any sorrow me molsteth, a happy man that such a love possesseth, constant in words, and always vows to love me. Mind me she will, but yet she dares not prove me. My heart by hope doth live, desire no joy doth give. My love and dearest life to thee I consecrate, heart of my heart's dear treasure, for I strive, by thy divineness too divine to nominate. Hope of approved faith in me must thrive, doth not the God of love that's most divine. Live in thy bosom's closet and in mine, Desire to that unspeakable delight. No sharp conceited wit can never set down. Joy in the world to worldly men's eyesight. Doth but ignoble thy imperial crown. Give thou the onset and the foe will fly. Amazed at thy great commanding beauty, death shall take my life away. Before my friendship shall decay, death, that heart-wounding lord, sweet lovers so shall lay his e-bone darts at thy fair feet, take them into thy hand and work my woe, my woe that thy mind's anguish will regret. Life, heart, joy, greeting, and all my pleasure, away are gone and fled from my dear treasure. Before one stain shall blot thy scarlet dye, my blood shall like a fountain wash the place. Friendship, itself knit with mortality, shall thy immortal blemish quite disgrace, Decay shall all the world, my love in thee, shall live unstained, untouched perpetually. Let truth report what heart I bear, to her that is my dearest dear. Let not foul, pale-faced envy be my foe. Truth must declare my spotless loyalty. Report unto the world shall plainly show what heart, dear love, I always bore to thee, heart framed of perfect love's sincerity. I cannot flatter. This I plainly say, bear with false words, I'll bear the blame away. To change in love is a base simple thing, her name will be o'er stained with perjury, that doth delight in nothing but dissembling. Is it not shame so for to wrong fair beauty? My true approved tongue must answer I, dearest beware of this, and learn of me. Dear is that love combined with chastity, seen hath the eye, chosen hath the heart. Firm is the faith, and loth to depart. Seen in all learned arts is my beloved. Hath any one so fair a love as I, the stony-hearted savage hath she moved. I for her eye tempts blushing chastity, chosen to make their nine a perfect ten. Hath the sweet muses honoured her again. The bright-eyed wandering world doth always seek. Heart-curing comfort doth proceed from thee. Firm trust, pure thoughts a mind that's always meek, is the true badge of my love's sovereignty. The honor of our age, 
the only fair, faith's mistress, and truth's dear adopted heir. And those that do behold thy heavenly beauty, loth to forsake thee, spoil themselves with gazing. To thee all humane knees proffer their duty, depart they will not but with sad amazing. To dim their eyesight looking gainst the sun, whose hot reflecting beams will near be done. No woe so great in love, not being heard, no plague so great in love, being long deferred. No tongue can tell the world my heart's deep anguish, woe, and the mind's great perturbation. So trouble me, that day and night I languish, great cares in love seek my destruction. In all things gracious, saving only this, love is my foe, that I account my bliss. Not all the world could proffer me disgrace, being maintained fairest fair by thee. Hard fortune shall thy servant never outface. No storms of discord should discomfort me, plague all the world with frowns my turtle dove. So that thou smile on me, and be my love, great mistress, matchless in thy sovereignty, in lieu and recompense of my affection. Love me again, this do I beg of thee, being bound by Cupid's kind direction. Long have I sued for grace, yet still I find Deferred I am by her that's most unkind. And if my love shall be relieved by thee, my heart is thy, and so account of me. And yet a steadfast hope maintains my heart, if any favor favorably proceed. My dear from thee, the cure of my smart, love that easeth minds oppressed with need, shall be the true physician of my grief, relieved alone by thee that yieldest relief. By all the holy rites that love adoreth, thee have I loved above the love of any. My heart in truth thee always favoureth, heart freed from any what, then freed from many. Is it not base to change? Yea, so they say, thine own confession love denies delay, and by the high imperial seat of Jove. So am I forced by Cupid for to swear, account I must of thee my turtle dove, of thee that time's long memory shall outwear me by thy steadfast truth and faith denying, to promise any hope on thee relying. My passions are a hell and death to me, unless you feel remorse and pity me. My sweetest thoughts sweet love to thee I send. Passions deeply engrafted, unremovable, are my affections, and I must commend a steadfast trust in thee most admirable. Hell round enwraps my body by disdain, and then a heaven, if thou love again, Death haunts me at the heels, yet is afraid. To touch my bosom, knowing thou lovest me, me sometimes terrifying by him betrayed. Unless sweet helpful succor come from thee, you well I know, the honor of mine eye. Fear, some remorseful help in misery. Remorse sits on thy brow triumphantly, and smiles upon my face with gentle cheer. Pity, love's gracious mother dwells in thee, me favoring abandoning base fear, death is amazed, viewing of thy beauty, thinking thyself perfect eternate. My purest love doth none but thee adore. My hearty thoughts are thine, I love no more, my comfortable sweet approved mistress. Purest of all the pure that nature framed, love in the height of all our happiness. Doth tell me that thy virtues are not named, none can give forth thy constancy approved. But I that tried thy faith, my best beloved, thee in the temple of fair Venus shrine, adore I must, and kneel upon my knee. My fortunes tell me plain that thou art mine, hearty in kindness, yielding unto me. Thoughts the much great disturbers of our rest are fled, and lodge in some unquiet breast. Thy never unremoved and still kept word, I powdered oftentimes within my mind. Love told me that thou never wouldst afford none other grace but that which I did find. More comfortable did this sound in mine ear. Then sweet releasement to a man in fear. I do resolve to love no love but thee. Therefore be kind and favor none but me. I sometimes sitting by myself alone. Do meditate of things that are ensuing. Resolve I do that thou must end my mind. To strengthen love if love should be declining. Love in thy bosom dwells, and tells me still, no envious storm shall thwart affection's will. Love hath amazed the world, placed in thy brow, but yet slavish disdain seeks for to cross. Thee and myself, 
that have combined our vow. Therefore that monster cannot work our loss. Be all the winds of anger bent to rage. Kind shalt thou find me, thus my heart I gauge. And from my faith that's unremovable, favor be seated in thy maiden eye. None can receive it love more acceptable, but I myself, waiting thy pitying mercy. Me hast thou made the substance of delight, by thy fair sun resembling heavenly sight. Ah, quoth she, but where is true love? Where, quoth he, where you and I love? I, quoth she, were thine like my love. Why, quoth he, as you love, I love? Ah, thou imperious high commanding lord, quoth he, to Cupid, gentle god of love. He that I honor most will not accord, but strives against thy justice from above, where I have promised faith, my plighted word, is quite refused with a base reprove. True loving honor, this I only will thee. Love thy true love, or else false love will kill me. Where shall I find a heart that's free from guile? Quoth faithfulness within my lover's breast, he at these pleasing words began to smile, where anguish wrapped his thoughts in much unrest. You did with pretty tales the time beguile, and made him in conceited pleasure blessed. I grace the words spoke with so sweet a tongue, love being the holy burden of your song. I graced your song of love, but by the way, quoth true experience, sit and you shall see, she will enchant you with her heavenly lay. Were you framed all of heavenly policy, thine ears should drink the poison of delay. Like as I said, so did it prove to be. My mistress' beauty graced my mistress' song. Love pleased more with her eyes than with her tongue. Why then in deepness of sweet love's delight? Quoth she, the perfect mistress of desire, he that I honor most barred from my sight. As a bright lamp kindles affection's fire, you magic operations work your spite. Loved to the mountain top of will aspires. I challenge all in all, and this I sing. Love is a holy saint, a lord, a king. Ah, love, where is thy faith in sweet love? Why love where hearts can join in true love? Why then my heart hopes of thy love's love? Else let my heart be plagued with false love. Why art thou strange to me, my dear? Not strange when as I love my dear but thou esteemest not of thy dear. Yes, when I know my dearest dear, why is my love so false to me? My love is thine if thou lovest me. Thee I love, else none contents me. If thou lovest me, it not repents me. Ah, quoth he, where's faith in sweet love? Why, quoth she, conjoined in true love? Ah, quoth he, I hope of thy love. Else, quoth she, I'll die a false love. Ah, my dear, why dost thou kill me? No, my dear, love doth not will me. Then in thine arms thou shalt enfold me. Ah, my dear, there thou shalt hold me, and holding me between thine arms, I shall embrace sweet lover's charms, though death from life my body part. Yet near the less keep thou my heart, though some men are inconstant, fond, and fickle. Death's ashy countenance shall not alter me, from glass they take their substance being brittle. Life, heart, and hands shall always favor thee. My pen shall write thy virtues registry. Body conjoined with body, free from strife. Part not in sunder till we part our life. Yet my soul's life to my dear life's concluding, ne'er let absurdity that villainy, thief, the monster of our time, men's praise deriding, less in perseverance of small knowledge chief. Keep the base gate to things that are excelling. Thou by fair virtues praise mayst yield relief. My lines are thine, then tell absurd it. Heart of my dear shall blot his villainy. Where hearts agree, no strife can be. Where faithfulness unites itself with love. Hearts pined with sorrow cannot disagree. Agree they must of force, for from above. No wind oppressing mischief may we see. Strife is quite banished from our company. Can I be sad? No, pleasure bids me sing. Be blessed, for sweet love's a happy thing. Thy vows my love and heart hath won, till thy untruth hath it undone, thy true, unspeakable fidelity. Vows made to Cupid and his fair-faced mother. 
My thoughts have won to virtuous chastity. Love thee alone I will, and love none other. And if thou find not my love's secrecy, heart favoring thee, then do thou fancy smother. Hath all the world such a true bird as I, won to this favor by my constancy, till that lean fleshless cripple, pale-faced death, thy lovely dove shall pierce with his fell dart. Untruth in my fair bosom never takes breath. Hath any love such a firm, constant heart? It is thine own, unless thou keep it still. Undone shall I be clean against my will. Time shall tell thee how well I love thee. Time, the true proportioner of things, shall he end show my affection. Tell thee from whence all these my passions spring, the honouring that of love have made election. How often I have made my offerings, well known to Venus and her lovely son. I to the wide world shall my passions run. Love is a lord of heart, a great commander, the challenging to be my chief defender, most divine and sacred. Have I found your love unspotted, most reverend mistress honor of mine eye, divine, most holy and religious love, and lord itself of my heart's empery, sacred in thoughts admitted from above, have in remembrance what affection willeth. I it revives the mind, and the mind killeth. Found have I written in your sky-like brow, your never-ceasing kind humility. Love for your sake to me hath made a vow, unspotted shall I find your constancy, and without stain to thy pure stainless beauty, shall my heart's bosom offer up his duty. The want of thee is death to me. The day shall be all night, and night all day, want of the sun and moon to give us light of a black darkness before thy love will stay. Thee from thy pleasure of thy heart's delight is not affection nursed to long delay. Death's messenger that bars me from thy sight to be in absence is to burn in fire. Me round enwrapping with hot love's desire. I love to be beloved. I do acknowledge of all constant pure. Love is my true thought's herald, and I'll sing to be of thy thought's closet firm and sure. Be the world still thy virtues deifying, beloved of the most, yet most of many. Affirm, my dear, thou art beloved of any. I scorn if I be scorned, I being not beloved by my affection. Scorn within my thoughts such bad disgrace. If thou of me do make thy firm election, I to none other love will give my place. Be thou my saint, my bosom's lord to prove. Scorned of all, I'll be thy truest love, the heart's in pain that loves in vain, the grief poor lovers feel being not beloved, heart's anguish, and sad looks may testify, in night they sleep not, and in day perplexed, pain of this sorrow makes them melancholy, that in disdain the silly minds are vexed, love's terror is so sharp, so strong, so mighty, in all things unresistible, being alive, vain he resists that gainst love's force doth strive, what greater joy can be than this, where love enjoys each lover's wish? What may we count the world if love were dead, greater in woe than woe itself can be? Joy from man's secret bosom being fled cannot but kill the heart immediately, because by joy the heart is nourished, then entertains sweet love within thy breast. This motion in the end will make thee blessed, where two hearts are united all in one. Love like a king, a lord, a sovereign, enjoys the throne of bliss to sit upon, each sad heart craving aid by Cupid slay. Lovers be merry, love being dignified, wish what you will, it shall not be denied. Phoenix, quoth our Chester. Hereafter follow diverse poetical essays on the former subject, viz. the turtle and phoenix, done by the best and chiefest of our modern writers with their names subscribed to their particular works never before extant, and now first consecrated by them all generally to the love and merit of the true noble knight, Sir John Salisbury. Dignum laude virum musa vetat mori, invocatio ad apollinum and perids, good fate, fair thespian deities, and thou bright God, whose golden eye serve as a mirror to the silver morn, when, in the height of grace, she doth adore her crystal presence, and invites the ever youthful Bromius to delights, sprinkling his suit of vort with pearl, and, like a loose enamoured girl, 
ingles his cheek, which waxing red with shame, instincts the senseless grapes to do the same, till by his sweet reflection fed, they gather spirit and grow discolored. To your high influence we commend our following labor and sustain our mutual palms prepared to gratulate an honorable friend then propagate. With your illustrate faculties, our mental powers instruct us how to rise in weighty numbers well pursued and varied from the multitude. Be lavish one and plenteously profuse. Your holy waters to our thirsty muse that we may give around to him. In a Castalian bull, crowned to the brim, Vartum chorus, to the worthily honored knight Sir John Salisbury, noblest of minds, here do the muses bring, unto your safer judgment's taste, pure juice that flowed from the Pierian springs, not filched nor borrowed, but exhaust, by the flame-haired Apollo's hand, and at his well-observed command, for you infused in our retentive brain, is now distilled thence through our quills again. Value our verse as you approve the worth, and think of what they are create. No mercenary hope did bring them forth. They tread not in that servile gate, but a true zeal, born in our spirits, responsible to your high merits, and an inventure freer than the times. These were the parents to our several rhymes, wherein kind, learned, envious, all may view, that we have writ worthy ourselves and you. Vatum Chorus, the first, the silver vault of heaven, hath but one eye, and that's the sun, the fool, masked lady, night, which blots the clouds, the white book of the sky, but one sick Phoebe, fever-shaking light, the heart, one string so, thus in single turns, the world one phoenix till another burns, the burning, suppose here burns this wonder of a breath, in righteous flames and holy heard fires like music which doth wrap itself to death, sweetening the inward room of man's desires, so she wastes both her wings in piteous strife. The flame that eats her feeds the other's life, her rare dead ashes fill a rare leave urn, one phoenix born, another phoenix burn, ignoto, let the bird of Ludis lay, on the sole Arabian tree, herald sad and trumpet be, to whose sound chaste wings obey, but thou shrinking harbinger, Foul procurer of the fiend, augur of the fever's end. To this troop come thou not near, from this session interdict. Every soul of tyrant wing, sow the eagle feathered king, keep the obsequies so strict, let the priest in surplus white. That defunctive music can be the death divining swan, lest the requiem lack his right. And thou treble dated crow, that thy sable gender makest, with the breath thou givest and takest, mongst our mourners shalt thou go. Here the anthem doth commence. Love and constancy is dead. Phoenix and the turtle fled. In a mutual flame from hence, so they loved as love in twain, had the essence but in one, two distinct division none, number there in love was slain, hearts remote yet not asunder. Distance and no space was seen, twixt this turtle and his queen. But in them it were a wonder, so between them love did shine, that the turtle saw his right, flaming in the phoenix sight. Either was the other's mine, property was thus appalled, that the self was not the same, single nature's double name, neither two nor one was called, reason in itself confounded, saw division grow together, to themselves yet either neither, simple was so well compounded, that it cried, how true a twain seemeth this concordant one. Love hath reason, reason none, if what part can so remain, whereupon it made this threeny, to the phoenix and the dove, co-supremes and stairs of love, as chorus to their tragic scene, threeno, beauty, truth, and rarit, grace in all simplicit, here enclosed in cinders lie, death is now the phoenix nest and the turtle's loyal breast to eternity doth rest. Leaving no posterity, t'was not their infirmity, it was married chastity. Truth may seem, but cannot be, beauty brag, but tis not she. Truth and beauty buried be. To this urn let those repair, that are either true or fair, for these dead birds sigh a prayer, 
William Shakespeare, a narration and description of a most exact wondrous creature arising out of the phoenix and turtle dove's ashes. Oh, twas a moving episodia, can fire, can time, can blackest fate consume, so rare creation. No, tis thwart to sense, corruption quakes to touch such excellence. Nature exclaims for justice, justice fate. Aught into naught can never remigrate. Then look, for see what glorious issue brighter. Then clear is fire, and beyond faith fair whiter. Then Dion's tear now springs from yonder flame. Let me stand numbed with wonder, never came so strong amazement on astonished eye as this, this measureless pure rarity. Lo now, the extracture of divinest essence, the soul of heaven's labored quintessence, peens to Phoebus from dear lover's death. Take sweet creation and all blessing breath. What strangeness is, is it that from the turtle's ashes assume such form, whose splendor clearer flashes? Then mounted Delius, tell me genuine muse, now yield your aids, you spirits that infuse, a sacred rapture light my weaker eye, raise my inventions on swift fantasy, that whilst of this same metaphysical, God, mad, nor woman, but exiled of all, my laboring thoughts with strained ardor sing, my muse may mount with an uncommon wing, the description of this perfection. Dares then thy too audacious sense presume, define that boundless ends, that amplest thought transcendeth, O oh, yet vouchsafe my muse to greet, that wondrous rareness in whose sweet all praise begins and endeth, divinest beauty that was slightest, that adorned this wondrous brightest, which had naught to be corrupted, in this perfection had no mean. To this earth's purest was unclean, which virtue even instructed, by it all beings decked and stained, ideas that are idly fain, only here subsist invested, dread not to give strained praise at all, no speech is hyperbolical, to this perfection blessed, thus close my rhymes, this all that can be said, this wonder never can be flattered, to perfection, a sonnet, oft have I gaze with astonished art at monstrous issues of ill-shaped birth. When I have seen the midwife to old earth, nature produce most strange deformity. So have I marveled to observe of late hard-favored feminines so scant of fair, that masks so choicely sheltered of the air, as if their beauties were not theirs by fate, but who so weak of observation hath not discerned long since how virtues wanted, how parsimoniously the heavens have scanted our chiefest part of adoration. But now I cease to wonder, now I find, the cause of all our monstrous penny shows. Now I conceit from whence wit scarcity grows, hard favored features and defects of mine. Nature long time hath stored up virtue, fairness, shaping the rest as foils unto this rareness. Perfection y hymnus, what should I call this creature, which now is grown unto maturity? How should I blast this feature, as firm and constant as eternity? Call it perfection. Fie, tis perfecteth it, brightest names can light it. Call it heaven's mirror. First, alas, best attributes can never write it. Beauty's resistless thunder. All nomination is too straight of sense. Deep contemplation's wonder. That appellation give this excellence, within all best confined. Now, feebler genius, end thy slighter rhyming. No suburbs all is mine, as far from spot as possible defining. John Marston, Peristeros, or the male turtle. Not like that loose and party-livered sect of idle lovers that, as different light, on colored subjects different hues reflect, change their affections with their mistress' sights, that with her praise or dispraise drow or float, and must be fed with fresh conceits and fashions. Never wax coal, but die love not, but dote. Love's fire, stayed judgments blow, not humorous passions, whose loves upon their lover's pomp depend. And quench as fast as her eyes sparkle twinkles, naught lasts that doth to outward worth contend. All love in smooth brows born is tombed in wrinkles. But like the consecrated bird of love, whose whole life's hap to his soul mate alluded, 
whom no proud flocks of other fowls could move, but in herself all company concluded. She was to him thy analyze the world of pleasure, her firmness clothed him in variety. Excess of all things he joined in her measure, mourned when she mourned, and dieth when she dies. Like him I bound thy instinct of all my power, in her that bounds the empire of desert, and time nor change that all things else devours, but truth eternized in a constant heart, can change me more from her than her from merit. That is my form, and gives my being spirit. George Chapman, Preludia, we must sing to what subject shall we choose, or whose great name in poets heaven use, for the more countenance to our active muse, Hercules. Alas, his bones are yet sore, with his old earthly labors, to exact more, of his dull godhead, were sine let's implore, Phoebus, no tend thy cart still, envious day, shall not give out that we have made thee stay, and founded thy hot team, to tune our lay, nor will we beg of thee, lord of the vine, to raise our spirits with thy conjuring wine, in the green circle of thy ivy twine, palace, nor thee we call our mankind made, that at thy birth madest the poor smith afraid, who with his axe thy father's midwife played, go cramp dull Mars, light Venus, when he snorts, or with thy tribade trine, invent new sports, thou, nor their looseness, with our making sorts, let the old boy your son ply his old task, turn the stale prologue to some painted mask, his absence in our verse is all we ask, Hermes the cheater cannot mix with us, though he would steal his sister's Pegasus, and rifle him, or pawn his Pegasus, nor all the ladies of the Thespian lake, though they were crushed into one form, could make a beauty of that merit that should take. Our muse up by commission, no, we bring our own true fire, now our thought takes wing, and now an epode to deep ears we sing, epos, not to know vice at all, and keep true state, is virtue, and not fate, next to that virtue is to know vice well, and her black spite expel, which to effect, since no breast is so sure, or safe but she'll procure, some way of entrance we must plant a guard, of thoughts to watch and ward, at thy iron ear the ports unto the mind, that no strange or unkind object arrive there, but the heart, our spy, give knowledge instantly, to wakeful reason, our affection's king, who, in thy examining, will quickly taste the treason, and commit, close, the close cause of it. Tis the securest policy we have, to make our sense our slave, but this fair course is not embraced by many, by many, scarce by any, for either our affections do rebel, or else the sentinel, that shall ring larum to the heart, doth sleep, or some great thought doth keep, back of the intelligence, and falsely swears, their base and idle fears, whereof the loyal conscience so complains, thus by these subtil trains, do several passions still invade the mind, and strike our reason blind, of which usurping rank some have thought love, the first, as prone to move, most frequent tumults, horror, and unrests, in our inflamed breasts, but this doth from their cloud of error grow, which thus we overblow. The thing they here call love is blind desire, armed with bow, shafts, and fire, inconstant like the sea, of whence tis born, rough, swelling, like a storm, with whom who sails, rides on the surge of fear, and boils as if he were, in a continual tempest, now true love, no such effects doth prove. That is an essence most gentile and fine, pure, perfect, nay divine. It is a golden chain let down from heaven, whose links are bright and even. That falls like sleep on lovers, and combines the soft and sweetest mine. In equal knots this bears no brands nor darts to murder different hearts. But in a calm and godlike unit, preserves communit. Oh, who is be that, in this peace, enjoys? thy elixir of all joys, a form more fresh than are the Eden bowers, and lasting as her flowers, richer than time, 
and as time's virtue. Rare, sober, a saddest care, a fixed thought, an eye untaught to glance, who blessed with such high chance, would at suggestion of a steep desire, cast himself from the spire of all his happinesses, but soft I hear, some vicious fool draw near, that cries we dream, and swear there's no such thing as this chaste love we sing. Peace, luxury, thou art like one of those who, being at sea, suppose, because they move, the continent doth so. No, vice, we let thee know, though thy wild thoughts with sparrows' wings do fly, turtles can chastely die, and yet in this to express ourself more clear, we do not number here such spirits as are only continent, because lusts means are spent, or those who doubt the common mouth of fame, and for their place or name cannot so safely sin, their chastity is mere necessity, nor mean we those whom vows and conscience have filed with abstinence, though we acknowledge who can so abstain, makes a most blessed gain. He that for love of goodness hateth ill is more crown-worthy still, then he which for sin's penalty forbears, his heart sins, though he fears. But we propose a person like our dove, graced with a phoenix love, a beauty of that clear and sparkling light, would make a day of night, and turn the blackest sorrows to bright joys, whose odorous breath destroys all taste of bitterness and makes the air as sweet as she is fair, a body so harmoniously composed as if nature disclosed all her best symmetry in that one feature. Oh, so divine a creature, who could be false too, chiefly when he knows how only she bestows the wealthy treasure of her love in him, making his fortunes swim in the full flood of her admired perfection. What savage brute affection would not be fearful to offend a dame of this excelling frame, much more a noble and right generous mind? To virtuous modes inclined, that knows the weight guilt he will refrain from thoughts of such a strain. And to his sense object this sentence ever, man may securely sin, but safely never. Ben Johnson, the phoenix analyzed, now, after all, let no man receive it for a fable, if a bird so amiable do turn into a woman, or by our turtle's auger, that nature's fairest creature prove of his mistress feature, but a bare type and figure, o den thansiastici, splendor, o more than mortal, for other forms come short all, of her illustrate brightnesses, as far as sins from lightness, her wit as quick and sprightful, as fire and more delightful, than the stolen sports of lovers, when night their meeting covers, judgment, adorned with learning, doth shine in her discerning, clear as a naked vestal, Closed in an orb of crystal, her breath for sweet exceeding, the phoenix place of breeding, but mixed with sound transcending, all nature of commending. Alas, then, with a weighed ah, in thought to praise this lady, when seeking her renowning, myself am so near drowning, retire and say, her graces are deeper than their faces, yet she's nor nice to show them, nor takes she pride to know them. Ben Johnson. Finish.